minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. Coolest Reptile Podcast in the world. Welcome to Trap Talk Reptile Podcast, episode 425. I'm your boy, MJ. Nick Mutton, round two tonight, baby. What an episode we have in store. What is good, everyone? Hope everyone's having a great Thursday night. Hope your week's going great. Uh, but yeah, man, I'm your boy, MJ. Hope you're having a good time uh, with everything that I've been putting out because I've been killing it lately in the podcasting scene, just saying. And I'm not going to stop. It's just starting. So if you're into keeping reptiles, either breeding, admiring, or just overall learning, this is the podcast to be subscribed to. Hit that subscribe button. First and foremost, hit that like button. Why don't we get the likes up? All right. It's Nick Mutton round two with Ryan Young. I have a special co-host tonight. So yes, get the likes up. Let's do that right now. And then hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Select all. You'll be on top of every single podcast I drop here on this YouTube channel. I drop three podcasts a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays. I do not miss you can also listen to this podcast on all the major audio platforms such as Buzzsprout, Apple, Spotify, Google Play, all the major ones. So wherever you listen to Trap Talk Reptile Podcast, thank you so much. It means a lot, especially for the guests, you know. So I'm having a lot of great moments with the guests that I bring on, but more importantly, having fun growing. So thank you for spending your life with me. And yeah, man, we're going to keep this going. Shout out to the early birds. I see you guys there. We'll get to you guys in just a second. Um, I do want to say, first and foremost, let's just start off by saying support U.S. ARC. Very important. If you keep a reptile, you need to understand what U.S. ARC is and what they do for us. So if you're one of those who needs a refresher or needs to study on U.S. ARC, I'll put that link in the description below. So make sure you click on it. Join the U.S. ARC team. Numbers matter. And help us fight for our rights, man. Thank you, Phil Goss. Thank you, the entire U.S. ARC family appreciate all you guys thank you for being on the same team um if you're looking for exclusive content if you want to get more out of what you see here on a weekly basis if you want to be like more vip and behind the scenes then look no further than joining the trap talk patreon family shout out to all my patreon members out there love you guys you're my heart but yes join the trap talk patreon family as soon as you join the patreon family you get a link to the discord that will tap you in with over 185 trappers tap you into an ig group chat that is just cracking nonstop. so thank you Again, for all the love and support, I'm blessed, beyond blessed to have people who are riding for me. And yeah, Trap Family for life. Appreciate all you guys. Trappers, you're my heart. Salute. Um, I do want to say that tonight's episode is brought to you by the Reptile Super Show. Pomona, here we go. January 5th and 6th and the 7th. It's going down. Pomona, California, Reptile Super Show. You can find the Trap Talk Reptile Podcast booth bending there. Best believe it. It's going to be an epic time. So don't miss it. Shout out to Rami. Who for throwing the number one reptile show in the country. It's going to be a great time. So many vendors, so many different species of reptiles, different awesome things to look at, so many supplies to pick up and take home. It's going to be great. So thank you, Robbie. Cannot wait. It's going to be cracking. And there's an episode coming soon with Robbie and a new adventure that he's taking on with a good homie. So be ready for that. Rami, we'll talk soon. Appreciate you so much. Also, I want to say that tonight's episode is brought to you by my good homie, Blake, over at Bear. Blake Exotic Feeders, please head over to Instagram. His quail game is no joke. Top level quail quality delivered to your doorstep. I'm very happy that my freezer is full of quails produced by this guy right here who puts a lot of hard work. Very passionate with his quail game. And go see what it's all about, man. Check him out. Blake Exotic Feeders, okay? Or just type in Bear on IG and he'll pop up. And his YouTube channel, Kraken as well. Blake Exotic Animal Ranch. Check it out. But thank you, Blake, for your support. And thank you for keeping my diet routine for my reptiles diverse. That's what I'm talking about. I uh, also want to say tonight's episode is brought to you by the homie Elijah and his awesome wife, Tiffany, from Juggernaut Reptiles. We're talking about a lot of diversity tonight, man. A lot of things to discuss. All right? So I appreciate Elijah and his wife on so many different levels for being diverse in the reptile industry and bringing so many awesome things to the table, especially at Tinley and shows at events and whatnot. But 
really, man, go check out Elijah from and his wife Tiffany over at Juggernaut Reptiles. Subscribe to his YouTube channel and make sure you follow him on IG. See what he has going on. It's no joke. One of the one of the best in the game, in my opinion, as far as being diverse and whatnot. And he's a, he's an OG, man. So thank you so much, Elijah, for your love and support. Um, it means a lot, man. And yeah, man, cannot wait to collab with you a lot more in 2024. It's gonna be popping. All right. Um, early birds, what's good? I see the early birds is popping right now. If you're in the early bird comments, if you have an important topic or an important question, or you just want to support the channel, drop a super chat. Don't be shy. Drop a super chat. We already got a super chat. Damn, look at that. William. Woo! It's my dog. It's my William's such a guy, man. And William, you need to come on this show first and foremost. But another person diverse in the reptile game who I truly respect. This guy right here, William Philippic. All right. Not playing around with the super chats, as you can see, he's coming correct. Uh, but Nick and Ryan are two guys I have mad respect for and have helped me out tremendously in herpticulture. I have a question for both of them. Okay. All right, William, we're going to hold on to this question. I didn't know there was a question involved, but hold on to that. We're going to get, we're going to get to that question because we're starting things off proper. Uh, but thank you so much, William, for being here. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Who else is here? They got the homegirl Becky Gallant in the building, repping Canada. What's up, Becky? Thank you so much for being here. The homie Mark Curry, Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Someone else who's looking very heavily to tonight's episode. All right. Appreciate the homie Mark Curry. Uh, Justin Campbell in the building, Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. The homegirl Chantel in the building, Trap Talk Patreon member, that Trap Elite OG homie. Thank you so much for your support, Chantel. All City Serpents, the homie James in the building. What is up, James? Thank you so much for being here, Trap Talk Patreon member. The homie, Sound Serpents in the building, Trap Talk Patreon member, Sean Perry. What's up, buddy? Thanks for being here. Appreciate you so much. The homie Robert, Orange County Conjos, Trap Talk Patreon member, all day, every day. Appreciate you so much. Northwest Herpetological. Man, we got PNW in the building. PNW is going to be repping hard tonight, just so you guys know. Looking forward to it. PNW definitely deserves a little bit more credit, I feel like. It's always Texas and Florida, but no, that's bullshit, man. PNW is cracking and i'm gonna show you guys tonight how that is um thank you so much zach trap talk patreon member all day every day bradley press in the building trap talk patreon member all day every day travis gordon tns reptiles trap talk patreon member all day every day ricky bobby the homie ricky bobby srt appreciate you so much trap talk patreon member one of the elites my dog josh squires in the building what's up josh squires thanks for being here buddy chuck chuck chucky madrid did i say that right madrid What's up, Chucky? Thanks for being here. The homegirl Autumn from Germany in the building. Chop Talk Patreon member all day every day. Celtic Reptiles in the building. What is up? Um, Lucid Arboreals. What's up, Lucid Arboreals? Thanks for being here. Chop Talk Patreon member all day every day. The homie man Freddy in the building. More Valley Reptiles. V Unit family all day every day. Scalpins and Feathers. The homie Josh in the building. What is good? Aurora in the building. What's up, Aurora? Thanks for tapping in with us. Really appreciate it. Eric's more factory. By the way, Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. Eric's more factory, V Unit family all day every day. The homie Diego, Cruz family constrictors, my right hand. Miss you, buddy. Hope you're doing well. Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. Alex Shrek in the building. The homie JD in the building. Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. Um, Brandon Wheeler. Hell yes. My dog, Brandon Wheeler. Thanks for tapping in with us. Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. And we're going to end this in style because no offense. Hottest girl in the chats, my wife. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Wife, I appreciate you so much. I swear to God, I won't let this go to midnight. I will do my best. All right, but we're going to end this in style because it's game time. But before we do that, my co-host for tonight, Patrick Holmes, who hey. just working out, and now he's here. What's up, buddy? Not a, um, I, I know I, I told you that I was going to be feeding snakes for the beginning of this, but um, I'm also going to be eating. I got to feed myself, too, for the first couple minutes, so I hope you don't mind. You son of a bitch. I mean, Patrick, what am I going to say? <laughs> am I going to say no? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't, I've, yeah, just eat it. Hurry up and eat. Um, I'm going to play this intro. <laughs> Do your thing. And uh, guys, be ready because it's going down. Uh, okay. Just be, why you take that first bite. For anyone out there who's wondering, mm. like, what, what's the big deal with uh, tonight's guest? Um, what would you like to say to that? Man, um, there's a lot of things I can say about that. Uh, but, the the thing that interests me the most is that we know these guys kind of came up together so it'll be really cool to see them on the show together but these are two of the most successful and well-respected python breeders ever um you know nick has been doing this for a long time and pr just produced a ridiculous number of uh of carpet pythons and other species and 
Ryan, I mean, he, he keeps a lot of different stuff, but man, he's produced what, like 30 species of pythons or something like that. So, yeah. um, I, I really, really admire both of these guys. Um, I've actually known Nick for, for a long time. And, uh, so I'm really looking forward to it just, uh, just to be listening in, but I, I also really appreciate you having me on. Yeah. You know, I, I just want people to know out there cause you know, everyone knows you as a conjure guy, like you're fucking Patrick Holmes, the guy who helps people keep chondros, but you're a lot more deeper than that, man. And, and, and I know it's because you just don't, you don't brag a lot about yourself. You don't really tell people what you really have going on, but I know you personally, and I know what your knowledge is. And I know that it's a lot more than just chondros as far as stuff that you geek out about. So I could, yeah. I could think of a better person to help me out with tonight. So thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate that. All right, man. Well, let you get your bites in. You have like about three minutes for this intro, so enjoy it. All That's right. all right. I'm, I'm having a pound of salmon and a banana. I think I can handle it. All right, guys. Do what you got to do to get your mind right. Do what you got to do to stay hydrated. Episode 425. Nick Mutton, round two with Ryan Young. Let's go. Shoot. Yes. You ready to do, do more in the future? Trap yes. Talk podcasts? Yes. Man. Only, only Trap Talk. Exclusive. Yes. Exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> oh. So stop calling us. <laughs> <laughs> From the spot, get the club to pop When I come up with the crop Gotta love it, love it or not I'm hot from the hop to the club the spot, get the club to pop When I come up with the club the spot Get the club to pop When I come up with the club the spot Get the club to pop When I come up with the club the spot Get the club to pop When I come up with the Everybody Episode 425, the return of Nick Mutton. There he is with <laughs> Ryan Young, a good friend of yours. Am I right, Nick? Yeah, yeah I've, I've, uh, I've known Ryan for uh, uh, quite a long time since we were, uh, we both had hair and then it was gray and <laughs> we're all, uh, yeah. Well, 90, 90, I've known 90, Ryan so long, but neither of our backs hurt. When I he, met Ryan, well, that's how long I've known Ryan. He was a teenager at a pet shop, right? Serving crickets, from what <laughs> yeah. I remember. Yeah, he was slinging crickets at a local pet stop, and I was just some, you know, dipshit hobbyist just starting out. But so I've known Ryan for uh, since we were kids, basically. Dang man, well I'm glad to have you back. And Ryan, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you back at the trap round oh, table. Nice to be back. Thanks for having me. Like your shirt. I didn't ask him to wear that, by the way. Oh, I met the I met this cool guy in Texas, and he gave it to me. So I figured it was only appropriate if I wore. <laughs> oh man, oh. you're trying to one up me now. Oh shit! Don't worry, Nick. Glad to see you. I got you. Uh, got a shirt waiting for you too, buddy. And Patrick, he just he always has every shirt that I come out with, but he you know he wears what he wears. I, man, I remember to... in the I remember in the '90s that Cal Zoo shirt was hot commodity, baby. Yeah, yeah. This one's not that old. I actually just got this shirt. I saw um, I saw Dan Maleri wearing it in one of his videos, and I messaged him while I was watching it. I was like, I need that shirt because it wasn't on their website. And then uh, a few weeks later, I bought a mangrove snake from him, and when I got it in, the shirt was in the box with it. Oh, that's cool. When we used to get orders yeah. from at the pet shop, man, it was a brawl. Who could get the shirt first? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we used to order from Calzoo in the 90s, too, when, when we had a shop. Yeah. Hey, so I want to say right, right off the bat, man, Nick, great episode when you first came to uh, Trap. I appreciate the, the, the awesome fucking content because I got a lot of great feedback. Um, but there were so many things that I wish someone else could, like, be a part of when you said, you know, a lot of things that night, you know. And, 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 and I know um, one thing I want to start off right off the bat is the ball python talk, you know, especially because you and Ryan have seen a lot of 
changes in the market over the last fucking decades. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but you have a little different feeling about this crash or this market change happening in the ball python game right now, Nick. Or what's your opinion on what's happening right now with ball pythons? Um, I think it's. I mean, you see this in all sorts of other scenarios outside of, uh, you know, just the hurt market. But when a, a system or a market becomes so completely dominated by one particular facet, then you're basically just primed for your own d destruction. Uh, at this point, the hobby is so ball python centered that if you added up every single other reptile and amphibian species on the entire planet Earth and you put all of them in one basket, the ball python basket would still be 10 times larger than everything else in the entire Earth added together. That means that nine out of every $10 spent in the entire reptile hobby is on ball pythons. So when they're that dominant and their market goes in the toilet and the bubble bursts, which it it's on this never ending cycle of boom and bust and it will ne that will never change. But it's so dominant now that when you're in a bust sort of cycle, 90% of the money is gone. 90% of the people who'd be spending money are not spending money because they're not making money. And this time it's actually affecting everything that isn't ball pythons. It's affecting the entire hobby because it sucked 90% of the money out of everything. The hobby is just way too, way too invested in one species. Uh, you see this with agriculture and the concept of monoculture where you, you know, like bananas, they're all the same banana genetics. You're, you're, you know, very close to disaster at that point. If you're all, if your entire economy is based on one species. Um, fun fact, one of the reasons for the Irish potato famine in the 19th century. If your entire country eats one species of one variety of potato that's susceptible to a fungus, you know, bad things happen. Our hobby is basically in that state. We are so, it's so focused on this one species that, you know, it sucks all the money out of the hobby and all the, and puts everybody in a down mood and it, it has this kind of spin-off effect on everything else. Ryan, he just compared the ball python market to a, a fruit crisis. What do you have to say to that? <laughs> well, I think it was a vegetable, not a fruit, but... Uh... <laughs> Damn it! That made me look bad. Go ahead. It. Uh, I mean, I agree partially with him, and I. I think there's an overall larger issue with the overall outlook on the economy of the everyday American that probably has just as big an effect on it as uh, that. But I think the the COVID prices and everybody going nuts during all that that hyperinflated the balloon, so to speak, and so the the crash was going to feel a lot worse than um, a traditional slight downturn. So what, 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 are, what are you doing with like prices being where they are? Cause I mean, you, you work, I mean, you don't work with a lot of ball pythons, but the stuff you work with is like relevant. It's really nice stuff. Um, but are you concerned about selling any of that right now? Or like, how are you treating how things are market price prices wise in the market? Ryan? Um, I mean, for me personally, it kind of depends on what it is. If I have a ton of it, then I'll be more flexible, I, I guess. If uh, if I just have one, you know, I take uh, Tracy Barker's advice and she says, you know, I can only sell it once. So it's no rush to sell it. I've, I've had a few people, you know, try to lowball me lately on snakes that I only had one of and I was like, nah, you know what? I'll keep it. Where I sell it for that, so yeah, I don't think I don't think the price is the issue. I think the I think the overall just we sell a commodity that people have don't need to survive on a day to day basis. So it's right. always going to be you know a luxury item, so to speak. And, and so, could, it, could it also be the amount of keepers we got during COVID, like the uh, first time breeders experiencing something like this that are kind of like losing their minds over why. The, the you know the animal that they were once invested in is now just completely slashed and fucking beyond yeah there's a lot of issues as far as um i think there's the reptile breeding industry is kind of two two hustles at once it's breeding snakes is one industry and selling snakes is a whole different industry yeah. and there's a lot of people that are good at breeding snakes and really horrible at selling snakes and then there's people that are really good at selling snakes and whether they can breed or not, I guess is less relevant, but 
Well, they, both uh, take both take a lot of effort. You would say, you know what I mean. I, I would say probably selling is harder than breeding for, for some people. <laughs> oh yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, for for a long time, I wholesaled the vast majority of stuff I produced because I I cared more about breeding the snakes. I wasn't. I mean, I like selling snakes too, but I liked it when it was just easy. Make a phone call, everything's gone, and it's off to the next year. But you guys, uh, you guys, you guys, you guys have helped a lot of people out there. Like, it's one thing that if somebody was excited for tonight's episode they had something to say about you guys mentoring them in some type of way um this guy right here william william uh Philippec, uh he has a question that i definitely want to make sure we get um asked right off the bat and uh, he has a question for ryan and and nick so let's see what this question for ryan is um but ryan your opinion on ultramel and monarch are they the same um what do you have to say to that <laughs> um i still believe they're the same um <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't uh i don't know if anybody's test i know i had a shed tested and it didn't come back as one of the forms but i haven't heard on the other form yet so i don't know i still believe it's the same thing i believe i even know what bloodline it is but it uh time will tell yeah and then nick there was a i would say uh you know youtube kind of gives you like a overall review of like how you did you know as far as the videos you put out and one of the best lives i had this year um numbers wise uh was the whole dg fucking people freaking out about dg being a polygenic and whatnot um so in in william's questions relating to that so uh nick wants to or william wants to know about um nick about polygenic and ball pythons and why it shouldn't scare uh people out of like working with like dg and stuff well it's it's like a lot of things it's what's fundamentally what has changed about desert ghosts absolutely nothing right all of your presumptions predictions investments things you were doing before you knew that still hold true who does it really make any functional difference and the answer is clearly no so why are people freaking out about it it's it's clearly heritable it's like if you find out that technically it doesn't it doesn't work exactly like you thought it did but it functionally makes almost no difference why is that a reason to uh to panic i, I don't understand that i'm I went through a similar process with the hypomelanism in Brettles pythons and having to figure out how that worked. And it's, it's actually more complicated than the desert ghost thing. But at the end of the day, it's completely heritable. It's no big deal. You just go about it slightly. You have to, it's just a slightly different process, but it was at no point was the sky falling. And it's not our, it's, if anything, it's probably for someone like me, I find it interesting. Um, it certainly wouldn't be an impediment to anything. If you like Desert Ghost before, I don't understand why anybody would jump ship on something that they actually liked based on that little revelation. Another yeah. thing is that what a lot of people, particularly in the ball python sort of side of the hobby, fail to understand is that virtually everything is polygenic. There are a incredible number of genes that code for some aspect of color and pattern in some way. And so when you look at a when you look at a morph or a morph combination, you're not just looking at the, the results of the mutant genes that you've steered to put in the same animal. You're looking at the totality of all the genes that they have for color and pattern, not just the mutant genes that you have selected to put into that animal, but all the other genes that you would consider to be wild type genes that also get their say. And those other genes make up the difference of why not every black pastel looks exactly the same. It's yeah. not because the black pastel is so variable. It, that gene is doing exactly the same thing in every snake. It's the balance of all the other genes that that snake has for color that influence color and pattern. They're getting their say too, and they're pushing and pulling. And that's what makes up what we think these variable mutations are. It's really mostly the variation scene that's caused by other genes. And if you look at it in that sense, everything is polygenic. So who cares? It's, yeah. you know... Your point. It's, everything is polygenic. Um, to top it off, he said they're out producing or they're out producing West Africa. <laughs> I guess <laughs> both of you, that's uh, pretty intense. Uh, thank you, Probably William. Right. I appreciate you so much. Now, I mean, what, what, what would you say the problem is with the ball python market? Then is it the morphs of uh, the, the too many morphs being involved or what, Nick? Like what? What? Because I know you said something on the last episode about like the whole idea of people wanting a ball python of for what a ball python is is like out the window. Like it's not you know, like being kept as like stuff should be, I guess, kept like what you were saying or correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I mean, I can't really say what people should do and what is, you know, right and proper for 
the masses. I can only speak for myself and you know, philosophically. But we've gotten to a point where I think it's an unhealthy sort of, I mean, do people, ball python people generally don't care about ball pythons. They care about mutations. It is 100%, the entire ball python hobby is entirely devoted to how many broken, non-functioning genes can I cram into one snake? That's what it is. You're collecting mutations. You don't really care. That's why nobody has a normal ball python anymore, because there's zero appreciation for what a ball python is actually supposed to look like. It's how many broken genes can I cram into one snake? And that's all that matters. And the economics of that and the potential revenues that are perceived revenues that can be brought about from that. And it's at that point, it's kind of a house of cards. It can't help but eventually come crashing down that. And you've you've also we've completely domesticated that species in an unfathomably short period of time. So you have an entirely. So when you domesticate a species, several things happen. Um, but most notably, you get more frequent reproductive events and earlier onset of sexual maturity and greater reproductive output over time. That happens with every domesticated species. So if you look at ball pythons 30 years ago, you needed a temperature cycle them to get into breed and you might breed a male to a female, maybe two if you were lucky. Now, these guys are breeding six month old, five, six month old males to 12 females and the females are only 18 months old and they're all producing eggs and they're not cycling anything. We have made them so easy to breed that literally anybody can breed them. You can breed them on accident. I've even bred them on accident. I have walked in, I know Ryan has too, where you walk in like, you didn't even know the female's grabbing and sitting on eggs. You're like, what? Like, that happened, happened to me three times this year. <laughs> if, if, if you can, if you've made it, if you've moved the reproductive goalpost via to be domestication to such an extent that you can literally breed them on accident, then of course you're gonna overproduce because anybody that merely has two of them is going to produce offspring. And then it's this exponential growth in population. Eventually, you know, you're gonna see a softening of demand because there, there's too many of them. It's it's unavoidable and entirely predictable. It's so the crazy Python. thing is in, in our time doing this, they went from that to the early literature was ball pythons are impossible to breed in captivity. Wow. Remember the short tail pythons too. Remember that? The short tail yep. pythons are really hard to breed. Like, what do you have to say to that though, Ryan? Everything you just said right now. Uh yeah, no, I mean it uh it doesn't help uh that the I mean I guess it it, do, it doesn't, I don't know, it's hard to say if it hurts or it helps. If the new people coming in and they're interested in breeding ball pythons, I guess that it's good that it's easy. Um, but so why do, you, why do you keep the stuff that you, that you have with ball pythons? What's Is, is it because of the morph, like you were saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, I get, I get to play mad scientist with them. I mean, I still have, I'm actually one of the nerdy people that still has a bunch of normal looking ones. I mean, they're double het for stuff, but they're, they nice. look normal. Yeah. So I don't, I don't just, I like to, I actually like stuff that doesn't have too many genes in it. I think the more you start slamming, you know, five, six, seven, eight things, it all starts basically looking like a washed out um, white snake with some speckles and that kind of doesn't really do it for me. I'd take a, I'd take a lavender or an ultramel by itself, you know, over most of that stuff any day of the week. I will say though, you know, the ball python game being what it is is what brings so many people in and kind of gets people who are, you know, not only okay they got ball pythons down, but shit they might be good at other shit too. You know what I'm saying? And it's it's a good gateway, I feel like, right? So, um, but I mean, shit, that's why I'm here. Ball pythons brought me here. I'm not gonna lie. So, do you feel like it's a good gateway at least when it comes to that, um, Nick? For the right people, Oops, it, it has been. It, it's a, like everything. It's never nothing in life is ever black or white. It's all shades of gray and nuanced. Uh, there have been undeniable positives that have come from the explosion of interest in ball pythons. There have been a lot of negatives as well. I don't know whether on balance it's been helpful or harmful, but you can't. I can't also deny the, the positive benefits that come from that influx of people into the hobby. You have all these people that got into the hobby thinking they were going to get rich quick on their five ball pythons, <laughs> and that didn't pan out for really anybody. But that's, you know, let's be honest. That's what a lot of people thought. Yeah. But some of those people stuck around. Some of those people that, that that delusion got them into it, but they became truly passionate about reptiles and pythons or whatever, and they're still around. They may not even be working with ball pythons anymore, but it was a gateway for some people who are turned into genuine, real, you know, 
died in the wool herpers and that was their entry point into the hobby so it did expanded the size of the hobby and that's good i mean right so wouldn't wouldn't deny the positive benefits of that yeah and, and patrick's obviously like he's on no sides on this and he's, he's somebody who's also seen a lot of different waves um but with ball pythons what, what would you say being on the outside looking in with with the ball python market patrick um well i've been uh around long enough to um, see it go through a, a lot of different stages. Um, and I, um, Nick, I'm glad that you mentioned the gray area thing, because I was going to have to give a little pushback on your extremist views that you were talking about there. Just a minute ago. Yes. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Just using, using superlative words when, when saying that everybody's in it for the morphs and that's all that matters. I agree with that, that there's a lot of people especially a lot of the breeders that they really don't seem to have any like they seem to have lost track that they actually like snakes at some point and it's just like the chondro uh, keepers. <laughs> <laughs> i uh i still while i'm sitting here while i'm feeding my snakes i'm still smiling and getting i was i was just feeding a little captive bred highland scrub that i got from james Oakdale, and i got a little bit giddy when she struck at me before hitting the mouse uh, i still enjoy all of my snakes as snakes um and i i'm not into the morph game at all like it just does not interest me whatsoever because i've watched it go from being all that there was was you know imported you know just wild caught normal ball pythons Right. to what it is now i got my first ball python at a reptile show for 29 dollars in like 90 i don't know 94 or 95 or something like that and i was fucking stoked about it i was really excited to have that snake and i thought he was awesome and i was a dumbass and i used to take him to school in a sock and put him on my desk while i was in class <laughs> and uh, he would just sit there in a ball which um brings me to today why I don't keep ball pythons because they bore the shit out of me. It's not because I don't think they're awesome. I think every snake is awesome. All snakes are awesome. I think some of the morphs are beautiful, but I do not like the mentality. And it's not just ball pythons. It's boas and retics and what, everything that there's lots of morphs of. I, I love all of those snakes, um, but I don't like the mentality of them not being animals of them only being commodities and just pushing for the next world's first and slashing eggs to pieces and finger fucking them for clicks on instagram or whatever i'm just i'm not into any of that shit. i don't know that sounds like some extremist views there patrick yeah it is it is that was wrong it is i completely but, agree with you but, but look <laughs> yeah look but at, at the same time um, like you just said, you were mentioning some of the good things. The the size of the ball python market, it's a driver. It's a um, it, it it doesn't just bring people into the hobby. It, making the hobby bigger as a whole is not necessarily a bad thing. If especially if I mean, both of you guys are are full time snake breeders. Right. I've read you know a, a handful of snakes every year. But I have a full time job. I'm not like dependent on it um, by any means. I, I need snake money to buy more snakes, not to pay my bills. So, um, so you know, it's, uh, it, it, I think that it's, it's a good thing that the ball python thing um, makes the whole thing as big as it is. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I, I, I'm not sure that I completely agree with the, um, with the mono crop uh analogy on that and which by the way he said bananas first so it was fruit and uh potatoes <laughs> are a root. And, and, and potatoes are a root they're not a vegetable i was eating banana when he said that i almost choked on it um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um anyways but yeah i i um you know, I think it's cool that lots of guys have made shitloads of money breeding snakes. I think that's awesome. Um, some of those guys, I think, are, are really legit keepers and actually love animals, too. But there's a whole lot of people that are that it's just the money and it's just the next big thing or whatever. And I, so 
like like Nick said, there's there's good and bad in it, but I I don't think that the whole thing is pinned on uh, just the morphs and that's all that matters or whatever. And I think that the vast majority of people buying their first or their 20th ball python still just love snakes and they think they're awesome animals. Yeah. Um, well, the reality is, you know, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing with all the other species if it hadn't been for ball pythons. Right. A lot of those species I got bartering with ball pythons, the facility yeah. I had I built predominantly with ball python money, being able yep. to be a, you know, a professional breeder, so to speak, that predominantly for many, many years was predicated on predominantly breeding ball pythons. And although mutton is ball python free today, other than, <laughs> other, other than, his, uh, other than the one in his uh, house uh, <laughs> or a couple in his house, whatever it is, they, uh, you know, his early success too had a lot to do with ball python money as well. So, wow. I, had a, I definitely had a ball python phase in the in the early days. I mean, I started out breeding carpets from in the nineties and, but in the, it's probably 2004, 2005 when things started, I definitely produced, there were years I would produce 20, 30, 40 clutches of ball pythons in a year. It was never all I did, but there was definitely a, a major component of what I did for, for several years there for well, quite a, probably almost a decade, really. It was a major component of what I produced. So. Um, well, we, and we use those funds to get this other stuff that we're doing now. So and that's how yeah. all ball pythons right here. It's the only way I got all this shit was because of ball pythons. I'm not. I'm it's not all bad. Yeah, no, it's not all bad. I just, but, but, I but it's not, it's definitely not all I wanted to do though. Like it, it was a great stepping stone. You know what I'm saying? And, well, here you go, MJ. I traded I traded some het ghost ball pythons for my first base in emeralds. Wow. Wish you could do that now. <laughs> what nice. year was that? Oh man, probably oh six, oh seven, something oh, like that. Shit. Damn. Ba basin pricing was also just a little bit different back then. Yeah, eight hundred, twelve hundred. Now, now, yeah. I, now, I will say, like Patrick can speak on this. I can't, unfortunately, but Patrick has been selling chondros um, all year or this year. Uh, and I, mm -hmm. I know other people who have sold basins this year. From what I've seen, there's no issues with the, with that market. And and I don't correct me if I'm wrong with the green tree pythons. Have you seen a slight even like decrease of people wanting to inquire on animals that you've had available? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And especially if we're if we're um, comparing it to three years ago or whatever, you know, two years ago, okay. um, two two years ago, I had very literally several times a day answered a message saying no sorry nothing available right now every single day without fail mm -hmm. now the, in the last couple of weeks I, I still i don't have a morph market page i don't produce a ton of stuff uh you know i produced maybe i don't know uh 120 snakes this year or something like that and 66 of those were chondros and uh um so the i don't I don't have to like really post stuff, but over the last few weeks, I had to post the same Bioc twice in my Instagram story and it's still sitting here. And I posted the um, the same Manaquari Sauron cross twice in my Instagram story. Um, and it it sold one after I posted it in the Chondro group, which I, I hadn't posted any of these things actually in the Chondro groups, but my point is that yeah, I'm not having to push really hard to sell stuff. It'll still sell, still sell if I if I push it. I'm sure it would go quick if I wanted to post it on Morph Market or Fauna or whatever. But it's nowhere near what it was where people were like beating my door down to buy all of my chondros at whatever I wanted to ask for them. Uh, three years ago, when I two and three years ago, I saw people paying fifteen hundred dollars for captive bred Beox that were not even produced by the person who was selling them. Mm. And I just like, I bumped my price up. I was, I had been selling reds to my friends for like 600 bucks. I bumped it up to 1200 and felt kind of guilty about mm. it. And, uh, but they, they still sell for that. My red Beox still sell for, for 11, 1200 bucks, which is crazy to me because like I, I 
built a lot of this collection based on three hundred dollar pet store beehives. So, um, but yeah, it's, there's definitely definitely been a change. Um, it's I'm just not struggling as much as I think some people who are selling a bunch of um, more common things are. Uh, but that goes back to something you asked me a long time ago about if I wanted to do this full time and I don't having my job, uh, it pays my bills where I don't have to worry about that type of stuff anywhere near as much. And I can just work with the animals that I really enjoy working with. And also those have mostly, I do have some stuff that's fairly common. I've got my brettles and my Amazon tree boas and stuff. And I actually have a few corn snakes um but uh, and bull snakes i do that stuff just for fun because i really really love those species they none of them really make me any money um but they you know the thing is that also it just so happens that most of the species that i love are uncommon enough that they sell very very easily um they're just harder to produce which is why they pull more money it's all about how how you know, if, if chondros were as easy to breed as ball pythons, everybody and their fucking grandma would be doing it and they wouldn't be as cool or as popular or as valuable. And Nick, you know, obviously I got that from our sound check. You, you, you mentioned something how like the ball python market crisis is affecting almost all sales in the reptile world. Um, it just creates kind of a sense that it's a bad time to spend a bunch of money on reptiles across the board and everybody's in kind of a downer mood and that, you know, it's like, well, there's an expression, a rising tide lifts all boats. Well, a receding tide does the same thing in reverse too. It's kind of <laughs> the mood of the yes. hobby is kind of like down, you right. know, it's, and it, you know, but at the same time, guys like Ryan and I and Patrick, you've been around for a million years too. It's, we've seen this before a bunch of times. This is, this is, yeah. by my reckoning, I think my fourth ball python market crash that I've witnessed. <laughs> it happens yeah. every five to seven years, and it's going to happen yeah. in five to seven years in the future again. Spoiler alert, it's going to happen again. If you're really committed to this and keeping and breeding these things is just part of your life and you can't imagine not doing it, you have to be, you have to be willing to ride out these down periods and economic downturns and everything. I mean, I... I talk to Ryan almost every day, just casually. We're like two grumpy old men complaining about all this stuff on the phone all the time. But <laughs> I mean, I can say, and I know I can speak for Ryan confidently, and I can say there isn't a chance in hell that this would ever put me and Ryan out of the hobby. There's no way. Mm. Like it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Would it be better if I, we'd both be probably happier if more people were buying snakes and prices and you know the, the hobby was in a better shape economically, but. This is not going to put either of us out of it. We're going to die with a bunch of snakes. Like it's like we're in this for life. Oh. I had to put. I actually just had my will drawn up since I'm over fifty now, and I had to put Ryan in my will as the executor, as a co-executor of my will. I named Ryan so that he's the only person I know who knows what all these snakes even are. So if I drop dead choking on a chicken wing tomorrow, Ryan will have to come over here as stipulated by my will and disperse with all these animals and figure out what to do with them all. Wow, good luck. Because I don't intend on ever not having snakes. So that <laughs> literally, it's literally in my will what to do with all these snakes. And you agreed with that, Ryan? You're good with that? Yeah, no, I'd help I'd help his heirs out getting rid of them. It's, this is <laughs> we're we're in it for life. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> okay, so how many how many different species of uh snakes have you produced this year, Ryan? This year? This year, just this year. I know. I don't keep track of year to year. God damn it, Ryan! <laughs> Fuck, bro. Hey, probably not that. Probably not that many. It's probably like well, I don't know, ten or fifteen. Not that okay. many. And what about you? Any pushback on sales, or and you know, have, having to do a little bit extra to kind of get a sale of uh, anything other? Yeah, than it's that? been slow. It's been slow, no doubt. Um, you know, it's just got to ride it out and. Like I said, I don't think the prices are the issue. I think it's just the overall mood. Mm -hmm. So you just got to ride it out. And when it bounces back, be ready to rock. Well, it's, it's not like it's just the reptile industry that's in an economic downturn. Where it's just We're kind of just having a shitty time right now with the economy. And that's just, just a, refle a, a reflection of that. Yeah, everywhere. It's, a, it's Everything's feeling this sort of an effect. Um, now, I, I will say... Um, Nick, 
uh, why are chondros so hard to produce? You would think chondros, yes. Oh man, you just trying to get a hot take out of me on this one, aren't you? Yes, I, I was waiting for it. I thought you were gonna All get right, onto this one when I know said why it. Chondros are hard to breed. Yes, turns what? out they're not that hard to breed <laughs> if you keep them like you're supposed to and keep them a manageable size. Turns out chondros, fun fact, are little tiny ass snakes, they're tiny. They're one of the smallest pythons in the world. And all these people, these big ass snakes that they read Greg Maxwell's book and think, well, don't breed your females to a thousand grams, which is absolutely fucking insane. And they wonder why these snakes lay 42 eggs and die by their eighth birthday and only two of those eggs hatch. And they have such terrible luck. It's because the snake was never supposed to be anywhere close. If you have a thousand gram female, you should have your chondro keeping license revoked. Like that's <laughs> nuts. They're not that big. They never should get that big. If you're, you're looking behind you, if it's that big, you overdid it. You fucked the snake up. That's why there's problems. <laughs> the average wild oh. adult female chondro is under 500 grams. And the average breeding male is under 400 grams. They're little tiny snakes that lay an egg not much bigger than a peanut M&M. They're supposed to lay 8, 10, 12 eggs and be under 500 grams. And when you make them vastly larger than they're physiologically supposed to get, they lay way bigger eggs. They die young have reproductive problems, and it's a shit show. That's what it is. It's this misconception of how big they're supposed to get. You see this in other things too. You see this in like, people read old crappy books on carpet pythons. They say, I see coastal carpets can get 14 feet long. So they feed their animals to their expectation of what they think they're supposed to get to, which is inevitably way bigger than is reality. And they screw the snake up. Most of these things breed a lot smaller than people think, and they're better off doing that. That's why they're hard to breed. They're people physiologically I, just mess them up. I told MJ on the phone earlier that um, that you were going to go on this rant if we brought it up because it's not the first time that I've heard it. Hey, pre and, uh, well, pre so, it and, yeah, and uh, and and I'm going to have to beat that rant up a little bit over here because um, uh, I, I knew that I, I knew that would be exactly what you said and. I, I agree that um, wild chondros, I, 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 I'm going to disagree on 500 grams for, for average adult females. And, and it, there's a huge amount of variability across localities with the size that they get. Um, I, I, and I'm going to, I don't know if I should say this in the beginning of the end, but, or, or the end, but uh, I'll get back to the fact that I today pulled eggs from the smallest female chondro that I've ever paired up. Um, and she laid a big old healthy clutch for me. So, but I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, it, it, the interesting thing is that I tend to get clutches roughly the same size, no matter how big the females are. I have fucking massive female chondros. None of my really, really huge ones were animals that I raised myself because I don't, I just don't feed like that. The animals that I raise, the females tend to be, I'm pairing them up when they're getting into like 650, 700, 750 gram range. Um, I do completely agree that we should not be pushing them to be a thousand grams um, that, uh, you know, and Maxwell's book did say that back in the day. Um, but people in the reptile hobby overall had a different mentality around feeding snakes. Everybody's snakes were fucking morbidly obese back then. It wasn't just a chondro thing. And, uh, and, and that's still problematic uh, uh, all over the hobby. There's especially yeah especially in the in the like morph market thing there you know it's the with ball pythons and retics and and boas people just push them to be just fat ass slobs power feeding them early on but um i have seen a well a couple of years ago i saw and i'm not i realize yes there's outliers but i'm saying that i think the average is bigger than that and i don't think there's any problem with with chondros being that big as long as they are lean and muscular and not fat. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of the coolest sorong I've ever seen, fresh off the boat, this snake was 850 grams and she was just lean and muscle and just big, badass. It, she was extremely high white. And uh, one of my buddies got her, but she unfortunately didn't survive. Um, but eight, 850 grams right off the boat. And Beox get way the fuck bigger than any sorong does. I have some just ridiculously huge biots. I have one that I got um, yesterday that is covered in huge scars. Like she seems like she grew up in the wild. I have no history on her whatsoever. She's 
easy six feet long. Uh, she's solid blue and white, which is pretty awesome. She's fully hormonal. Um, but yeah, what's that? Yeah, go ahead. Right. Um, I, I, um, I haven't put her on a scale. I don't really care. She clearly has been obese at some point, like whoever had her in captivity for the last, however many years was overfeeding her at some point, but is not anymore. But I bet she's 16, 17, 1800 grams somewhere in that neighborhood. And she's not, you can tell she used to be fat, but she's not anymore. Um, I also used to have another Bioc that, do you have the, did I send you a picture of me holding her? Yeah, I'm going to pull it up. Right um, yeah. All right, hold on. My bad. Other way. That's not a Bioc. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, and a uh, big bitch, bro. So, and, you know, I'm not a huge dude, but I'm not tiny either. I'm 5'10, like 165, just to give you a reference. And that's not forced perspective. She's up against my body right there. Um, I used to have another wild caught Bioc that was six and a half feet long and 1,850 grams and really, really lean. I mean, really lean. And, uh, you know, so I, I just think there's certain localities. Some of the southern types get huge. Uh, Moroccan animals, some of the, the southern PNG stuff, they get really big. Um, but I do agree that most people push their snakes to get too big. Um, and I think that the way that they're fed and like the percentage of body fat that they have, it plays a big role in the clutch size because almost all of, I've, you know, I'm not like the, uh, most successful guy in this ever, but I've hatched 22 clutches of chondro. So it's a, you know, a decent number. And, uh, the and i have eggs in the incubator right now and a, and a female in the nest box right now um and the almost all of my clutches have been in the 12 to 18 egg range no matter the size of the female and um and i think that that is kind of a healthy captive clutch size range i think that talking about breeding 500 gram females and saying that's average and talking about what they do in the wild doesn't really um translate well to captive husbandry because in the wild first of all you know they're not always having food abundance sometimes they're struggling to eat of course they're going to reproduce as soon as they're small uh, big enough to reproduce animals in the wild are going to reproduce as soon as they're sexually mature because that's their job because they might get knocked off the next fucking day so they have to breed as soon as they can that doesn't mean that it's optimal in captivity to have 500 gram female chondros breeding I don't think it is at all. I agree completely that you raise them up too fast and get these big fat ass females and breed them. They're going to die young, but start breeding your female chondros as soon as they hit uh, 500 grams at, you know, whatever, 30 months old and see if that doesn't wear them out real quick too. My money says that it would. Um, right. I, I like to wait until my girls are almost five and preferably 700 ish grams to pair them up but i will end this by saying that today i pulled a female off a clutch that was 600 grams and lean when i paired her smallest female i've ever put to a male and she laid 14 average size eggs zero slugs all perfectly fertile mm. all right rebuttal time yeah uh, i don't think any of that matters what matters is, <laughs> I don't, there's a huge disconnect to what we're saying here. What I'm saying is, it's not my opinion that chondros, the average adult chondros, 500 grams or less. That's the data we have from the wild. You don't find yeah. them bigger than that. Like, well, you do. I mean, we're talking to Daniel Natush got a long time ago and he cataloged up like it was like a thousand and five or something. He's just a hair over a thousand wild individuals from all populations. And out of that 1,005-ish snakes, seven were 1,000 grams or more. Seven out of over 1,000. Yeah. It turns out the average adult, wild adult, from all populations is about a 450-gram snake. And males about 100 grams smaller. You do find outliers. Yeah. There were five, six, 700-gram snakes, but they're vanishingly rare compared to the 500 and under range when animals of any species and it doesn't matter if we're talking about dogs cats humans whatever chondros when they achieve mm -hmm. a larger than average size the results are always poor fecundity poor fertility and early death it doesn't mean that every animal that gets to a large size is going to die young and it doesn't mean that every animal gets to an abnormally large size 
is going to be a poor producer. But on average, if you plotted all this out on a graph, the trend line is really clear. They don't live as long. They don't produce as well. They have all sorts of problems as a result of exceeding low, large body size. There are always exceptions. You know, I, I, hope I you agree with that. Does great and lays a hundred eggs. That's a gorgeous snake. She, but she's awesome, but she may not. She looks like she's a hundred years old. So I don't even know if she'll breed. But that's another thing. This concept of adult size with snakes is so widely misunderstood in that people think there is yeah. such a thing as an adult size, and there isn't. Snakes they are grow forever. growers, so yeah. they don't ever stop growing. In yeah. the wild, you know, what limits their size is prey, prey size and prey availability and life expectancy. If you had an animal, the average chondro, let's say an average aru chondro is 450 grams for a female. You might find one on one little offshore island that just has a really idyllic life and lots of food and not a lot of predators. And it might live to be 50 years old and get to a freaky size. Those yeah. outlines, that can happen if they live in a productive environment and uh, live an exceedingly long life, they can achieve a very large size. That doesn't mean they're reproducing at that size in the wild. That just means, you know, <clears throat> they might get there eventually, but that's not yeah. generally the case. And when we feed to, if we say, if the average adult female is 450 grams, what you're saying is don't breed them until they're literally almost double the size of an adult female in the wild. And that seems like, you're already don't breed them until they're abnormally large that's i don't i mean the last i i gave up breeding chondros and i'll admit it it's petty but because the hobby the chondro hobby was just too frustrating to me it was all about hybrids and all this stuff and it was just and i was a locality guy because i knew it was obvious 30 years ago that these were different snakes they were different species whether or not you needed a taxonomist to point it out to you it was obvious back then um and I just got frustrated with the hobby and the mindset. So I just quit breeding chondros because I didn't want to deal with it. And frankly, at the time, I was producing a lot of carpet pythons. And I was at my wits end dealing with all the carpet python nitwits arguing with me about hybrid carpets and all this kind of stuff. The thought of dealing with the, <laughs> those same issues with a whole different group of people was just too much. That's why I don't keep boa constrictors or retics. Same thing. It was just, it was all I could do to deal with the carpet pythons. But the last time I bred them, I bred a pair of pure waminas. And the female weighed 349 grams. And the male, weighed, the male weighed 247 grams and ate fuzzies. And the results, they were five years old. Five. I worked, raced up. Five years old. And the results were nine perfect eggs, 100% fertility, 100% hatch rate. The snake went on to produce a few more clutches and it died at like 13 years old of cancer, of all things. It got a tumor. And, and even when it died, it was about 500 grams. Okay, well, can I, I, let, me, let me just let me just say so real quick, Nick, because I feel like I've seen so many people out there <clears throat> feed a full-grown chondro something really small. And for me, I came into this thinking, fucking like like what what you're saying. Let's get this fucking chondro up to a thousand grams. Like that was my what I was taught. Like let's you know get it to a fucking medium rat. But I always saw that other people, and these are a lot of people who've been around for a while, from what I can tell, but they feed a lot smaller. And I just feel like a lot of this shit is becoming misleading. I mean, we got to correct this shit now. Like, like if the female I just told you I bred at 349 grams. It never ate anything larger than a decent sized hopper mouse. That's crazy. Um, chondros are not the most active animal. They don't have huge caloric demands. They're mostly just sitting there most of the time. If you feed a rat, if you fed, well, even if you just check the species of, you, if you fed an adult mouse, like a large adult mouse, or if you fed a rat that was exactly the same mass as that mouse, they are not equivalent. The rat is younger and has a way higher fat percentage of body fat than a mouse does. My older animal, the older prey animal, even at the same size as the rat, is leaner and it has more, it has a it has, you know, it's more protein, less fat. The rat is gonna have a much higher fat content. So even the what you're feeding them makes a difference. So if you feed leaner, older prey, even if it's the same size, you're probably doing your snake a favor. Rather than that, that is that's true up to a point though which is why i i feed everything mice and uh, and i believe ryan said something about taking tracy barker's advice earlier this is what this is what tracy, this is what tracy does as well you feed everything mice all your well, i'm not i'm not I'm, I'm not done yet i feed everything mice until they're big enough to eat weanling rats because at the point where when you get to that size, that size equivalent, all the mice that you get above large, all the jumbo mice 
are flabby, weird looking blobs. All the, all the jumbo mice are just the retired breeders that look fucking terrible. At that point, they have a bunch of fat. Their muscle has begun to degrade because it's called sarcopenia. It happens to all vertebrates as they age. And uh, so, and weanling rats, uh, because they're now weaned and they're not on a bunch of milk, that's when they, that's the point where they start to lean out. Um, also, it's well documented the rats, the rats that chondros eat in the wild, which is ex almost 100% exclusively their diet as rats are on average the size of a small to medium rat at what we call that in the hobby or the size of like an adult African soft bird, which I personally think is like the ideal prey item. I think an African soft bird rat is like the ideal prey item for, for adult chondros. Um, and I, and I never, um, I don't think that people should push their girls to get huge, but here's another thing about the chondros being easy to breed or hard to breed and the, the fat snake idea. I've been saying since 2009 or 10 that people kept their chondros too fat and a lot of people agreed with me. I've known people for a long time keeping their animals on smaller prey items and on uh you know leaner animals smaller adults so the thousand gram thing is is barely even a thing anymore and the only reason that we're seeing uh higher success rates is because there's a lot more people doing it and a lot more people sharing information i don't think chondros are difficult to breed at all they're just not easy to breed like ball pythons are whether that's from domestication or not, I, that's, that's a concept I never even considered until I heard Nick talk about it. Um, but the, the, one of the things about ball pythons that you can't argue versus green tree pythons is that uh, chondros are just less tall. It's just, um, this is a, on their husbandry and not breeding, um, but it applies to, to reproduction as well. Green tree pythons are far less tolerant of neglect and abuse than a ball python is. Ball pythons will put up with a lot more shit before they roll on you uh, compared, compared to a green tree. And so while I don't think that we should be pushing our chondros to get massive, I also think that trying to breed them on fuzzies and hoppers in three and 400 grams is more just like proving a point that it can happen and not necessarily anything close to optimal. And I know I've, I remember reading Natusha's stuff about the size of the animals but I also don't think that wild weights are necessarily optimal either as if your if your goal is to have an animal that has a, you know, a, a, I'm not saying pushing for a maximum output, but to have the best kind of results um, in captivity. I don't, you know, if, if you see, take a 500, the, the female that I pulled off eggs today, 600 grams when I paired her up ish. I don't, I don't weigh them a whole lot. She was 550 when I got her, never weighed her again, but she wasn't much bigger when I bred her. Yeah. She laid 14, uh, really nice eggs today, but she looks like fucking shit right now. She's just sunken to nothing, man. She's, she's shriveled up. No way in hell I would pair that snake next year, no matter what kind of weight she puts back on, you know, and, uh, I'm going to put the weight back on her with rats because uh, once, like I say, once they hit that weanling size, that's what I feed them. Ryan, and I have snakes with medium rats. Reproduction on an annual basis is really rare with any python. With the I, possible I would agree. Anteresia, mo virtually no pythons breed annually. It's always biannual or triannually before they build up enough fat reserves. But we in the hobby have this have become accustomed to this idea that snakes breed every year and we'll just breed them again and we'll feed them up and breed them next year. And that is yeah. so not natural. Yeah. And that's another thing we do that just hastens their demise by pushing them to breed every year when that's not <clears throat> what they're really supposed to be doing. Yeah. Even, uh, even animals with higher uh, metabolic rates. I know Tim Brophy um, has at least one pair of bull snakes that he co has year round. He keeps them at real low temperatures. They're in the in the seventies most of the time, and uh, and he said, I remember one specific pair. He said these bull snakes, which you can put weight on a bull snake in weeks, like they, they'll they'll eat as much as you'll feed them and get they'll put on weight real fast. The pair that he kept together all the time, they bred every other year, 
every other year, bull snakes. Um, Tom Crutchfield keeps Dominican boas and Jamaican boas together outdoors, and they breed every other year. Yeah, I want to hear what Ryan has to say as far as all the chondro sizes and, and whatnot. What's your take on all this, uh, Ryan? Um, well, I kind of – I'm somewhere in the middle. Most of my female chondros are probably 600 to 750 grams. Um, they usually lay 11 to 15 eggs. Um, I only feed mice. I mean, I, that – it's not that I've never fed them a rat, but it's very rare. I would have to be really low on mice and desperately want to feed a chondro. And that's pretty rare. I usually don't. If I can remember the last time I fed a chondro, I'm feeding it too much. So that's, that's all, my thing. A lot of your chondros, from what I've seen, because you sent pics, they, they, they look pretty lean. They don't look big, but they, you know, they, they don't. Yeah, they're, they're lean. Muscle builder. And you, and you have them on rats at all, or are they just on mice? No. Nah. I mean, I, if, I probably, I can't even remember the last time I fed a rat to a male chondro. Um, I think the last time I fed a rat to a female chondro was, was when I thought I needed to feed for a reproductive event and I didn't, I just didn't have a mouse available. So it was more of a timing thing. Um, otherwise I would never, I would never know or never choose other than in a situation that I thought I desperately just needed something to go into that female's mouth, right? I would so never choose to feed a rat to a chondro. So your so your biggest female is taking like a jumbo mouse. Yeah, oh. mean mouse, jumbo mouse, if whatever I've got. <laughs> usually it's a, you know, usually it's like I wean the mouse, and then the next week I'll feed it. Okay, now now let's be honest. A lot of this relates to multiple other species that we're talking about that we could be talking yeah. about. Yeah, uh, scrubs. I wanted to. I was. Yeah, scrubs. Ask, I want to get 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 talking on scrubs, uh, <laughs> malukins. You know, I'm raising up a pair of United States Captain Born and Bred malukins, um, and I've been told by a good friend of mine who lives in Europe, who is uh, his name's Casper. You know who Casper is, Patrick? I think you might you might know who he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah Ka uh, Casper Fonag. Right, I right. can't remember his whole name. So but yeah, I, but yeah. I remember he was the first telling me he's like, dude, I don't know why people think these Malukans need to be huge, but they're not big. Like they're not supposed to be big. He was telling me, don't feed them rats. And like, and I was like, wow, this is crazy. And so I, I want to kind of bridge to how this really relates to other species that maybe people have problems getting yeah. successful with and, and, and how this relates and even carpets too and all that shit. Let's 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 bridge it to that. I, I want to hear I want to hear Nick's take on this, but I want to say two two things really fast. Um, number one, just to make this real clear, most of my female chondros are under a thousand grams. I just have a couple of biox. I have like maybe one, two, three. I don't have any non biox that I can think of that are over a thousand grams. Um, I just have a few older biox that are big ass snakes. Uh, most of my females are in the like seven, 800 gram range. And most of my males, except for some of my really old males, have some really old males that are probably like, you know, I'm talking 16, 17 years old that are 650, 700 grams. Most of my males are 300 to 400 grams. I keep them small and lean and I feed them adult mice or weanling rats on occasion. They, they get to eat every once every three, four or five weeks. When I don't have a schedule, I just kind of feed them whenever. Um, I, but yeah, and, and I also have a pair of Malukins that are siblings to yours. And um, I, I've heard Nick talk about this before, but I just want to mention, we were also talking about the, um, the market and the changes and stuff. And the, um, if you, I just wanted to mention something about if, you, if you've been around for a long time looking at trends in pricing, I remember in 2000 and i know what i paid for the malukins that i have now before i got these malukins i had never paid more than 150 dollars for one what? i've had a good, yeah. a good number of them i've had a good number of malukins uh -huh. and i've never paid yes and in 2008 nick mutton posted for sale a pair of u.s captive bred rolf kern malukins Really nice gold animals on kingsnake.com for $800. I damn near bought them. And I was like, I just, I know they're captive bred, but I just can't justify spending $800 fucking dollars on a pair of Malukin <laughs> pythons. Yeah, that that kills me every time I think about that. Uh, 
Yeah. I uh, knew Rolf a little bit, and so I actually had pick of the litter. I got my I got first pick out of that entire clutch. Oh, fuck. And then you know <laughs> life life changes happened and everything, and my uh, well, now ex wife at the time you know at the time it looked like she was likely to get laid off because of what was going on with her employer. So I sold a bunch of snakes that I knew would sell to kind of pad the bank account just because I expected a disaster was imminent. So I sold that. I sold them. I sold an adult captive bred adult female annulated tree boa because <laughs> like, I had, I had, but I had a, I had a trio of them. So I sold one of the things I knew would sell and I'd be able to sock some money away. And then of course she yeah. then goes and doesn't get laid off and I don't get those snakes anymore. But yeah, prior to that, I don't think I've ever paid more than a couple hundred bucks for a Moloch and Python. So I can't buy them now. Yeah. I just can't make myself do yeah. it. What's, yeah. the cheapest, I, what's the cheapest, what's the cheapest any of you guys seen a Bolin's Python ever? Seven fifty. Seventeen fifty. I was uh, seventeen fifty for me. Oh, uh, about eight hundred dollars. Yeah, they were seven fifty, eight hundred bucks on Cam's list back in the day. Damn. The crazy thing is, like, I I didn't buy them then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like I didn't I didn't buy them when they were seven hundred fifty bucks. <laughs> was it you, Nick? That called them a one big giant messy colubrid? Wasn't that you? Well, said no, that? no. I I wouldn't have said that, but I mean they're. I can't remember. I, to me, yeah. they don't hold any special sort of reverence or anything. I think that the hobby has a, as a whole has a problem in that there's this phenomenon where people, you can't basically decide if an animal is cool because it's expensive or expensive because it's cool. And I think Bolin's pythons are a little bit expensive, cool because they're expensive. And for some people, there's a little bit of that going on. Because it's so expensive and it's, it's just a montane scrub python. It's a basal montane scrub python. It's absolutely nested right in the middle of the scrub python complex. It's not special. It's a scrub python. I, I, I think, think they're special. I think they're special. <laughs> I think they're cool, but there's it's something, like they're there's not, something majestic to them, man. I see. I've I held a full adult, and I'm sure you have too. But so I, I, something I, about I them, bro. To me, they hold no extra fascination over any of the other members of that species complex. I if mean, you could say you could have all the Bolin's pythons you want or a pair of Bismarck Archipelago scrub pythons, oh, I'd be yeah. jumping on those Bismarcks in about a hot second before oh, a Bolin's yeah. python. Yeah. They're, right. they're, 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 yeah. they're not less cool than that other stuff, but to me, they're not any, they're no cooler than a Moluccan python. I mean, I, I agree with python that. Is a fantastic snake. I, I, yeah. I, I, I will never forget after, in, in, you know, experiencing holding an adult uh, Bolin's python, I, immediately related it to like an adult scrub because they break yeah. the same, they have the same manner ma mannerisms and they just it is a scrub <laughs> yeah it they're is. they're just uh they're a little a little bit slower than the others than the scrubs that i've, I've no, messed they're with short, short, they're short bus scrubs that's what they are yeah wow. yeah but that's i weird. um i i'll say they're they're malukans conzros and uh um and bolin's pythons they're, they're my top three pythons um, I, I love Bull and I. They're just, they're gorgeous. I just don't, I don't think they're worth eight and ten thousand dollars. We're saying one of the most highest priced snakes in the game is a short bus snake. That's what Ryan Young is just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking crazy, man. <laughs> I, I, well, that's I would like I, that's my experience with them, anyways. Well, I mean, there there was somebody behind the whole raise in price of these things, right? I mean, I, you know, the, it it comes down to maybe one or two people and why they're fucking the, the way they're priced right now or is it or or no mike correct me if i'm wrong uh, you're not totally yeah, wrong. i mean it's it's, <laughs> a, it's a combination of it's one of the few animals indo won't export like the uh, the older snakes which is good mm -hmm. they don't they didn't have a great track record yeah. um yeah but the, baby, but the babies agree. are the babies were coming in and then covid you know shut down indo and so the babies got real scarce and that just you had the COVID snake buying craze. They got extra scarce. Everybody, like, you know, the Svangali effect, everybody wanted what they can't have. And then the few yeah. local that were able to get them were price gouging. And, you know, because the I know, I know people who bring them in and they aren't paying much more for them now than they did in 2005. So it's the people they sell them to that are asking the huge markup, not the, not the people bringing them in. No, isn't it? I don't know if I'm just tripping over this, but I've heard a lot of people who try breeding Bolins have the female either ovulate or something happens to the female and she ends up dying. Um, I've heard a lot of like the females not making it after a while. Um, 
due to poor too diet. Fat. Tell them, Nick, they're too fat. I'm, I'm serious. Too I'm serious too. I'm serious too. They're too big and fat. You ever yeah. ask anybody that's actually ever bred them successfully and hatched them and ask them how big the female was. And they will all tell you the same thing. It's always like a skinny eight foot snake. It's never these big giant 14 foot monsters. When they get that big, they're ruined. And everybody, <laughs> why it's, they're, it's the same reason why everybody has a hard time, not everybody, but a lot of people have a hard time breeding any scrub pythons because they keep seeing that scrub pythons get 15 feet long. So they feed their scrub pythons so they're 15 feet long and they wonder why they never breed. You know what breeds? Yeah. Seven foot scrub pythons. Well, you know Brandon, uh, you guys all know Brandon Wheeler. Yes. Brandon Wheeler is a good friend to all of us here. Yeah. Brandon's had yes. a pair of Southern scrubs and he was on one of the pages and everything. And everybody's telling him, oh, they're too small to breed, too small to breed. I told them, they'll breed, they'll totally breed, just do it. Yeah, and guess who got a clutch of eggs? And I got some of the babies from that clutch. It's like yeah. six, males will breed at six feet, females seven, seven and a half feet and lean. And they're good. That's when they breed the best. It's mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm about to take my first attempt at breeding scrubs. And the females that I have are, there's they're F2 Southern siblings. And they're five years old. Um, and the bigger of the two... She can handle a, a large rat, no problem, but I usually feed her mediums and she's probably seven and a half feet long and the smaller female is probably six and a half feet long. And uh, the male oh, that I'm going to use, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll and the male like, I'm going to use, he's probably three and a half years old and five feet long or something like that. You'll get like nine or 10 eggs, but they'll absolutely yeah. seven and a half feet. She's going to go, she's going to bounce back and she's going to live a long life. That's perfect. Yeah. And she's yep. She's five years old, you said, and that size. That's the other thing. She's yeah. not I, some I raised those the, snakes. Yeah, I bought those snakes as babies and raised them up. That's the perfect, that's the perfect, that's the dream group. Seven and a half, three, five years old, captive bred. You're probably gonna have absolutely yeah. no problem. The problem yeah. breed, nope. I, they're not that difficult when they're but I yeah, they're you, I've never in my life color seen too. Has anyone here okay. ever seen a 15 foot scrub pylon sitting on a clutch of eggs? Cause I've never seen that in my life. Not once. No, but I think, I think Yasser, Yasser bred some, some scrubs that back in the day that were, that were good size and, and fat. He, some of his girls were pretty fat, but uh, you know, I don't know how many clutches he produced or whatever. I think he got one clutch of Malukans up from a fair, kind of a, a, a pretty fat female, but yeah, I've never seen. I've seen some massive scrub pythons. Uh, uh, the the exception being King Horn Eye, though. I think I've seen some pretty big Aussie females, but I mean those things are just they're big snakes. Well, I caught a fourteen foot really... gravid King Horn Eye in Australia. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, <laughs> it was Ryan's a big, got me there. Snake. The only King Horn Eye I ever yeah. seem to find are like three foot little juveniles. So. <laughs> but it was yeah. still a lot like if it was if that snake was in captivity at that length it would have been twice as big around twice the girth yeah yes yeah, so people the scrubs are super super skinny snakes man it just it always it's always kind of irked me even you know 20 years ago to see uh, a fat scrub python they're just they're not supposed to they're just not supposed to look like yeah, that. Yeah, no, a nine a nine foot scrub should look like a, a five foot, six foot carpet python. Like when it's yeah, curled exactly. you, should, you should look at it and be like, oh, that's only six feet long. And then when you pull it out, it's just like, oh, it just keeps coming. <laughs> I just I just uh I just sold a 10 foot male bar neck and he was, you know, that big around and extremely, extremely healthy weight, in my opinion. The two female uh Southerns that I have that I'm about to pair up. One of them's pretty significantly bigger than the other one, which is interesting because they're, uh, you know, I, I think people, um, this goes back to what we're talking about, about chondro size. I think there's a huge amount of variability. Um, even these animals are siblings that have been raised on the exact same feeding schedule since I got them when they were a couple months old. And one of them is probably 20% larger than the other one. Um, well, you know, I mean, obviously, Patrick, as a, a fitness enthusiast yourself, you, you realize, I mean, you know better than most that individual metabolic rates are, are variable based on individual. Yeah. And although they might be siblings, one of them is probably is clearly more efficient at extracting nutrients from the same amount of prey yeah. and thus has grown more. And yeah. that, that's a variable metric, even among clutch mates. Yeah. 
yeah, that's that's the problem with nutrition and, and fitness is that uh, you can count calories in, but uh, you can only guess at calories out. Yeah, that's two people can eat exactly the same. One gets fat and one's super lean because somebody's just more efficient at processing yeah. that. Well, well and some animals, is. some animals are just more active too. I mean, y'all y'all see how I eat versus how I look. I eat like a like like a, the fat kid inside of me, but. Uh, I'm high. I'm high output. Yeah. <laughs> as hey, long I, as you keep the output up. I want to ask. Yeah. Nick, I want to ask Nick and Ryan what they feel would be appropriate to to raise a Malukin as far as feeding it as it's getting to adult size, and 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 then once it gets to adult, what would you guys feed a breeding pair and whatnot? I, I want to hear this. Uh, well, we'll I'll, I'll. I guess I'll go first. Uh, <laughs> You can't really make a hard and fast rule as to how, what to feed and how much to feed and how often to feed because of that variability in metabolic rate. Um, generally speaking, most of this stuff, you can't really screw something up in the first year. You can feed stuff pretty heavily that first year and they'll grow, grow, grow. Yeah. What I tend to do is as things start getting closer and closer to sexual maturity, I start to taper off the feed. And you don't want to just rock yeah. it up to sexual maturity. You want to kind of glide into it. And right. so I'll taper the feedings off, prey size, prey frequency. And so if you want to kind of just ease into it softly into sexual maturity. It, and if you define, well, I'll define sexual maturity for those Malacans. That male's going to breed when it's about six feet long. And the female will be perfectly capable of reproducing about seven feet long. And if you let her get over 10 feet long, you're probably never going to get an egg out of her ever. That's your window of time. And just, But how much you have to feed, that you basically just... Feeding often enough to maintain good body mass and muscle tone after that certain point, you don't really, you're not trying to get size out of them anymore. And that's right. gonna, you have to kind of fine tune that based on your animal. I mean, the temperature of your snake room will make a difference as to how much it eats, yeah. and how much it's, it's metabolic rate, everything. So you can't really make yeah. a hard rule. But you find that balancing point where this animal maintains, is lean and muscular, but doesn't really get any bigger and stays about this size on this sort of a feeding regimen and and that's what you go with but uh yeah is that line with you ryan i think for me i shoot for growing them to adult size in about four years and then trying to read them when they're five years old and when they hit adult size at four years i basically don't feed them for six months and then <laughs> then when i start cycling i can slam them with food and i think that's a big that's a big kicker to get them to reproduce so that's another thing that i think we should talk about is you know, recycling a lot of people have methods of not feeding their snakes for a fucking long time and then at a certain point they kick it on and that's what seems to help them be very successful um when it comes to you know having production um obviously you know we're, we're talking like food cycling here you know um what's is do you do you go quite a while without feeding anything at some point nick Oh yeah, I love not. I love winter cycling. I don't have to feed anybody, and no one shits or anything. It's great. Like you, you walk us how, like walk us through how that works for you. Like how how you do that. I mean, there are exceptions for some species, but generally speaking, I don't think I will feed. I just fed the last round of feed. I cycle everything very late compared to everybody else. I started dropping the temps. I'm done feeding as of this last week, and most of my adults won't even see a meal until April of next year like absolutely nothing doesn't matter if they're gravid females i feed them nothing until after they lay and it, yeah and it works fine and then the rest of the time i have to make up for that shortfall while i'm not feeding for this block of time i will all their feeding happens you know in the other months of the year but it's a well-known documented thing that food cycling that a seasonal food availability has an influence on follicular genesis and reproduction um Everybody, most people are familiar with the concept of temperature cycling and that that can influence that. Food cycling can do the same thing. And what you find is some species, the food cycle is probably more important than the temperature cycle, especially with more equatorial things like from Indonesia. And some things that are more temperate, like in Australia, the temperature is probably the, is a, a primary driver. But both are important for everything. So finding the right balance between those two things uh, is where success lies, in my opinion. So, you, so, I mean, April, that's about six months. So you do six months too. You're the same shit that Ryan's talking about. Yeah, summer. but we yeah. do it completely different. He we does do it. I don't feed in the summer and he feeds, no, doesn't feed in the winter. 
Oh, so okay, you feed it, you feed while you're pairing, and he yeah. doesn't feed while he's pairing because nope. he gets all the food in there. He gets all the food in there before the pairing goes down, is what you're saying. Yeah. Now I've I, I grew up and I came up doing it the similar way that he he did it. And when I started focusing more on breeding Indo stuff versus Australia stuff, it wasn't working out as good for me. So mm -hmm. I switched it up. And since then, it has I have not been as consistently breeding Aussie stuff since doing it that way. So I believe some of my shortcomings on breeding some of the Aussie stuff is doing it that way. So I'm I'm having now I'm trying to manage my collection two ways where I feed the Aussie stuff in the summer, not in the winter, and vice versa. So it's mm. you it's it's hard it's it's easier to do everything the same, but if you're trying to breed a wide variety of snakes, it it's the one recipe fits all. You can get a recipe that bakes you a pretty good cake no matter what, but you got to tweak the little things to try to breed a vast array of species all in one year. But if you didn't have Aussie shit, then you would just do one thing. You would just have the one concern as far as when to feed and when not to feed. Yeah, that's how I would do it. I would feed very, very, very sparingly in the summertime. And September, I start hammering. And, and Patrick, how do you, how do you, how do you, you know, you know, work out like food cycling and all within your collection with the adults and whatnot. So I, I, I've had similar experiences, but I've also, I saw with chondros, they, they seem like they can kind of go anytime um, with my brettles pythons. And, and I always wonder with a lot of this stuff, we, if there's certain things that we do a certain way, because one person had success with it and that person was well known. And so that's what everybody has always done since then or whatever. And I'll, I'll give an example of that with um, everybody that I ever talked to that was breeding brettles, which I, I bred my first, I got my first brettles clutch in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, as, as a side note, I traded a Wamana chondro for a Rolf Kern Malukan Python, which I in turn traded for a trio of brettles pythons. <laughs> which back then back then sounded amazing right now i would never get rid of a female womana chondro or a rolf kern malukin python but uh, uh but i I'm, I'm glad that i did it because i fucking love my brettles pythons i know nick's on that with me uh he i remember he told me some years ago that that was his favorite species of snake yeah, they, they, and uh it's a super underrated fucking species of snake so man. underrated man brettles pythons to me are the if you want a pet python they're the ideal python they they get big enough to be impressive but they're not so big that they're unmanageable they're stunningly beautiful and they are fucking bulletproof snakes they they come from the harshest nastiest environment in the wild and so the the parameters that we keep them in can are so much more narrow than that that we can be really variable with it and uh, and it doesn't do anything to them. Where they live, it gets really fucking hot, really fucking cold. It's really dry a lot of the time. They don't get to eat or drink very often. Like they can just withstand so much. And they're, they're just, I, I can't say enough good things about Brettles pythons. They're one of my favorite snakes to keep. Um, I always cooled mine because that's what everybody else said to do. And I used to take mine, um, uh, recently in recent years, I take mine up to my warehouse at work cause it gets into the fifties there. Um, and a couple of years back, I, um, decided I wasn't going to breed mine that year. I was going to give the girls a year off and I kept them at home and I still cycled them is because I just stopped feeding them, stopped feeding them in November. Mm -hmm. And that's how I do with, with anything that I, that I, that I cool during the winter. So all my North American stuff, um, and like my diamond pythons, I stopped feeding in November and I won't feed them again until whatever, early March or, or whatever. I would take them to, to my shop because it'll get into the fifties and sixties at night in the warehouse. And, uh, the year that I decided not to breed them, I kept them at home. Their daytime temps were about 80 under the heat panel. Um, I just had them in my living room at the time. And their nighttime temps were whatever room temperature was. So, you know, 68 to 70 degrees, something like that. And um, I started feeding them again in like February that time. And man, uh, my female 
Debbie, um, she started developing, was showing obvious development, and my male wouldn't eat and was going crazy cruising. And I said, fuck it. And I threw him in, and I got my biggest clutch ever. She gave me 25 perfect eggs and uh, big, healthy, perfect babies. So, you know, I, I don't think that the cooling them that deep is just, uh, it's obviously not absolutely necessary to do that. Um, but so I don't know if it was because I, I food cycled them or I, I'm not sure. Hey, <laughs> so that, that animal right there is, uh, 18 years old. What makes, what makes a steak like this so underrated? You guys would say though, like wh why, why isn't it not getting the love that you guys think it should get? I have no clue why. I think people are smoking crack, sleeping on brittles. Just needs more morphs, right? <laughs> That's, yeah. Well, you've been working on that for a long time, dude. More morphs. <laughs> um, I think I, to speak to what you're saying with your brettles and the temperature cycling and lack of that, it's that's a multifaceted sort of thing. Uh, the fact the follicular maturation cycle that ultimately results in eggs takes a couple of years. It's not something that starts in one year. It's a longer process than that. Yeah. So you have been in the habit of cycling them colder and everything and then you took a year off and basically cycled them very light but they were already yeah. in this in this rhythm that train had already left the station a year ago and so I agree. it just it carried through another thing i touched on the concept of domestication and how that re it moves the goalposts the reproductive parameters brettles pythons when i got mine in 1998 mm -hmm. we're now i'm five generations four generations further down the track of domestication than that. So the Brettles pythons of 2023 are going to be a little bit easier to breed in terms of what they need as far as stimulus than the Brettles pythons of the mid 90s when they first yeah. entered the hobby. Because we're just yeah. the ones that needed the most dramatic temperature cycling to induce a fertile mating were less likely to produce in the first place. Thus, they left fewer offspring. And the ones with, that needed less left more offspring. And over time, this endless march of accidental domestication happens and they get easier and easier and easier. Yours is an older vintage at 18 years old, which I, I can tell you, it does my heart such good to see an old ass snake. A python yeah, me too. 18 years old and still producing. Like that's, it, it, yeah. it's sad that I have to be excited to see that. Like that should be a common yeah. thing, but it's not a common yeah. thing. Right. They should, they live yeah. a long time. They should, there should be a lot of 18 to 20 year old pythons in people's collections and there's not enough of them. Yeah. So that's I have a, a, a I have a Bioc female that's at least 18. She was imported in 2005 um, as a, a baby. But, you know, sometimes we get yearling Biocs that people call babies. So she's at least 18. And I'm going to give her a go this year. Yeah. Her first time or what? Uh, first time for me. I don't have any. Supposedly the guy that, that raised her up never never tried to breed her or something. I, I don't know um, if that's the case or not. But um, she she doesn't look like she's 18. She looks like she's. 10 maybe mm. and uh we see a lot of 10 year old females that look like they're 30 because they've been pounded <laughs> into the dirt since they were four so um and i have a lot of chondros in their teens whole bunch of them i've got a, i've got a bunch of uh i have a good number of animals that are 2005 2006 2007 animals yeah that's I, awesome. I will say what stood, out, what stood out that nick said was like because this is a what i was told too that you know, after eight, nine, ten years old, a female that's bred chondro wise, it, it doesn't last. It's it's pretty much tapped out after that. But theoretically, a snake that a snake should be in its prime around that time. You would say then, right, Nick? It shouldn't. It should. Oh, absolutely. Be oh, absolutely. The fact that most of the time that's not the case is more. That's the hobby's fault. That's our expectations. That's hammering them with food, trying to breed them all the time, getting them up to size at too young. You know, this, like this slow and steady. I mean. There should be a lot of these. There's no reason why a 15 year old female shouldn't be able to lay a perfectly good clutch. I have noticed, and I'm sure Ryan would probably back me up on this, that when you have older female pythons, when you start getting at 14, 15 years old, it, reproductive events become less common. They breed less often. You get start to get you do get smaller clutches and eventually lower fertility rates as they get older. But they're still capable of reproducing. Like I. I've got some water pythons available right now for my 18 year old pair of original animals doing just fine. She now lays, mm -hmm. lays a clutch like every three years, but you know, yeah, I think I'm about to lose uh, my geriatric snakes. Yeah. Uh, she'll be producing into her twenties. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I've got a pair of jungle carpets that were produced in 94. Nice. And then I've got a Stimson's nice. Python that was an adult when it showed up in the late in the late 90s or no, late 80s. Late 80s. Yeah. Pre 1990s. Yeah, I got one of them. Well, you ever think that's almost you ever say that's almost 40 years old? Yeah. Stimson's Python female. Whoa, dude. Um, Jay, uh, what is it? Jay Jacoby. He had a 44 year old female, um, uh, black pine snake lay, give him one fertile egg, uh, this year or last year. She's, she's old enough to have been legally collected as a black pine. Most, <laughs> yeah, most people don't know that, that doesn't mean anything to most of the people listening to this, but that really old jungle carpet only ever laid one good egg si since I've had her. And she was probably in her what late twenties when she did that, so yeah. she's never laid another egg since. But so she got a big she got a big tumor on her neck now, so I don't think she's long for this yeah. world. Is, and is, the males yeah, I've, kind of wobbly. I've lost older ones to cancer too. Is it really a point to where if you have a certain habit of feeding a snake, it it, it is too late? Like even if there's an a there's no like a certain point where there's time to adjust and give it time to like slim down. Like you're saying, once it gets to a certain point of being fat, it's fucking just you're fucked. No, you can you can trim them up and they can be okay. They're probably not going to live as long as they would have originally. Nick said about the Malukan getting you can, cut feet. It's fucked. It's well, you can't if you've grown something up to it's just way larger than it ever should have gotten. You can't. <laughs> reverse that and make the snake shrink you can reduce excess body fat and you can mm -hmm. so if you you can mitigate the damage from overfeeding by reducing weight and slimming them down over time and getting to a leaner more muscular build but you can't totally remove all the damage if, if the snake is if you have a spotted python that should have been 36 inches long at the very most and it's five and a half six feet long and i've seen a six foot spotted python i thought it was a carpet at first i could not believe it you can't make that snake three feet long again. You can lean it out and you can probably add a few years to its life, but it's probably never going to live what it should have lived had it been, you know, well, look at humans. We all see, but I guess it's not a fair analogy because humans, we are genetically limited in size, but on those rare, you don't see many seven or eight foot tall humans, but when you do see an eight foot tall human, they usually die in their twenties. They don't, you can't shrink the cost of being oversized you can't escape that. You can well, mitigate it by a, weight loss. Uh, that's a totally can't. fair. That's a that's a fair analogy, though, because um, it's it doesn't just apply to eight foot tall humans. Uh, how many six foot four eighty year olds do you know? It's that 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 actually applies all the way across the board. Your your body as you get older, the chances uh, uh, the the way gravity affects you, the chances of imbalances. Um, one of the other issues is, uh, is stability. The taller you are, you just have less stability. So I'm sure even though that doesn't directly translate to snakes, I'm sure there's similar things going on with, with oversized snakes. Just things well, like uh, cardiomyopathy. If your body it gets to an unnaturally large and overweight size or yeah. large size, in the, in the case of a reptile, your, their heart needs to be larger, gets enlarged to pump blood to this giant body. Even if you yeah. then take that snake and you shrink its body fat content down and you lean it out, it still has a heart that's too big. There's a heart yeah. doesn't shrink. Uh, and you end up with, I mean, you know, uh, I, I lost a friend recently to this exact condition. And it's like, yeah, you're, you, the, the, the pressure your heart goes through to pump blood to an oversized body is not to be underestimated. And even if you get yeah. your act together and you lose that weight, you're still... You know, and you're you're infinitely better off if you do. Yes. But you can't completely reverse the damage that's done. Another yeah, issue with that. raising stuff bigger than it should be is that the bigger the snake is, the, it behaves differently with its thermal mass. And so when you're trying to get something that's extra big, it takes longer to heat up, takes longer to cool off. There's and yeah. so if you get if you give two snakes the same amount of heat every day. But one of them's a monster snake, and the other one's an average sized snake. The average sized yeah. snake can cool off and recover from that heat gain, where the big one's not going to do that. It's going to maintain more of that heat for yeah. a lot longer period of time. So it just yeah, adds that concept of like the relative surface area that people don't get. Like the, the smaller something is, 
it has proportionally more surface area to its vol to its mass than the larger thing does. So the larger you yeah. are, you retain heat better. I mean, last winter I cycled my Brettles pythons. I got them down to 47 degrees, which is totally mm. not necessary at all. They just happened to get that cold. And I got my little Ray Tech gun out there and it's 47 degrees and I tempt the snakes and they're like 68 degrees. Like yeah. their body temperature in the morning is 20 degrees above ambient just because they're yeah. big and they've coiled up into that heat conservation pose that tight coil to retain, to concentrate their body mass to retain that heat through a cold yeah. night. Whereas, yeah, I remember you know, eight years ago when I first bred jungle carpets a long time ago, one of the funniest things that ever happened to me was I was cycling my snake room and my male jungle carpet was sitting on the helix probe. And I went in my snake room in the like early in the morning before the power turned back on. And I'm like, why does this probe still read 80 degrees? I turned the power off 12 hours ago. Like it should be my room 70 degrees. And it was like, oh yeah, because the snake didn't drop one degree. It was still 80 <laughs> degrees. Wow. You know, yeah. it was, you know, yeah. his equal mass. He didn't lose any heat at all over the course of the night. He didn't move. He was just he was curled up there when I you know when I turned the night drop on and he was still sitting there in the morning, didn't look like he ever moved, and he did not lose one degree of body temperature. That's why I'll never put a, uh, a a probe on a perch. Yes, and some people set up their conjure cages and they put like zip tie the probe to the perch. That that's the snake coils onto that. It's going to throw everything all the way off. That's also yeah, why I don't you like. Don't give him a basking spot at all. Then it's just a lot easier. Well, I actually I keep everything. All of my adults of all species are kept ambient, and I only provide uh, supplemental heat for gravid females of everything. Everything that's it. I'm pretty much that way. That yeah. can work well as long as you, you're not, again, though, that discussion is tied completely to what you're feeding and how much and how large. If you're feeding sparingly and you're feeding smaller meals, totally works. If you're feeding giant yeah. rats, will not work. It's, no. so that, that works it, because you feed sparingly well, and feed responsibly. I fed yeah. some pretty big meals when it was cold and didn't have any issues. Well, I, fe I feed, I'll feed larger meals, um, but I will. I also adjust the frequency, so it's it, you can't have larger and more frequent meals with the ambient doesn't jive as well. Yeah. Um, a big meal in itself, though, usually isn't a problem, even if it's relatively cool. But you know, we're yeah. talking a lot about meals and dieting. But you know, if you don't got your temps fucking figured out, that's a whole other issue, right? Like that also could kind of keep you from being successful when it comes to breeding if that stuff isn't dialed in. I mean, you have some people that don't switch shit all year round, like no matter what they do, they stick. Well, to things system. change whether they shift it or not. Right. You're I mean, yeah. it, yeah. we know that just look at when you set your thermostat on your house to 72 degrees in the yeah. winter time, you feel like you're freezing your balls off. And in the summertime, you're like, Oh man, this feels great. Right. No, so, yeah. hundred percent. The ambient, what? you know, climactic changes affect you, whether you think you're changing the temperature or not. Something I'd, I'd like to point out that, I mean, anybody listening to all four of us talking about our different experiences and the different ways we do things is, and this is, I think would be helpful for a lot of people to understand. And that is that there is no one way to do this. Yeah, exactly. that all, that all of us are doing things in different ways, some more close to others, but we're all doing different things and we're all successful. And one thing that, and this is something like, you know, much as it bemoans me to acknowledge, I, I learned this from Ryan, even though because you know, <laughs> I've, I've got seniority, but, uh, uh, and that is, that, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to Ryan, exchanging ideas and whatnot. And I, I've just concluded based on talking to Ryan that it isn't, what you do does matter, but the fact that you're consistent, that you could probably do it wrong. And if you did it consistently wrong for long enough, it would probably be right. Like, Snakes are adaptable. So is that if what you're, you're really saying? Like, I do shit wrong enough and then I get it I'm right. saying that if you do it wrong enough, <laughs> that's, that's a backhanded compliment. It's like, it's like there's different <laughs> versions of right. Well, what people, a lot of people do, and Ryan, I've talked about this one to death, you know, privately, is that they try to breed a difficult thing and it doesn't work. So then they think, well, shit, what do I do? Then the next year, well, I'll do this other thing. And then that doesn't work. And then they think, well, hell, then they just keep... 
it's this idea that there's a magical recipe for success. And if you just keep trying around and thinking outside the box, you'll eventually hit on the magical recipe and they'll breed. And there is no magical recipe. It's do the same shit every year. Give an animal consistent, whether it's temperature or food, a consistent yearly cycle of temperature and food, whatever you're doing, they will establish an annual rhythm that will key into reproduction if you keep consistent. If you keep changing what you're doing in your whole approach every year, trying to hit on some magical combination of factors, you're never going to hit that because you've never given them consistency long enough to develop that, that seasonal rhythm. So I don't know that yeah. it, the fact that I feed all in the summertime and not at all in the winter, and Ryan does exactly the opposite of me, and we both produce, I produce 15 species of pythons this year, and Ryan's probably pretty close to the same number too. And we did it completely different. I provide basking spots to everything all year long. Ryan almost never does. It, it works. It's like we're doing very something similarly, but some things very differently, yet we both have roughly equal success. But we do the same thing year in and year out. So and you're that saying consistency keep, over time matters. Keep doing the wrong thing and eventually becomes right. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Let's not let's just, if it eventually becomes right, then it proves it wasn't the wrong thing. Right. I'm saying that there isn't, you know, I mean, if you're keeping everything in an ambient temperature of 65 degrees, that's probably objectively wrong. But there's a lot of wiggle room with this. Like, you know, I mean, if you keep I everything in 82 is, degrees ambient, you can get away with that and you can be successful with that. I think. But if you did one that one year and then you temperature cycled at. them the next year and then you cycled them really cold the third year, then you went back to that, you probably never read anything. It's good, man. Allow think, them that, that rhythm. Yeah, I think what you're getting at is in our early years, we can speak from what we did, like trying to breed some of these hard to breed things. It'd be like, oh man, we're pairing our Nada this year, and they would they would breed, and so you would think, oh, okay, you know, but then they wouldn't lay, and you're like, oh, next year, man, it was the cage. I gotta put them in a different cage, I gotta spray them more, or I gotta drop the temp 10 more degrees, or I got to do yep. this. Or maybe I need to start cycling in November instead of December. And you're just constantly moving things around. And I don't think the snakes ever settle in. And so you're better off to just decide, this is what I'm going to do. This is when I'm going to do it. Keep the snake long enough. Eventually, the snake will fall into line with what it's consistently getting. And that's where I think a lot of the mistakes people make trying to breed harder to breed, you know, rarer species that there's not as much information about is they... They think they're they think they need to do drastically different things every year because what they did the other year didn't work. And I know personally I can say that's a hundred percent bullshit. I want to think yeah. give them want, consistency long enough, they're typically gonna fall in to what want, you're doing. I want to take something back energy wise that I put in earlier in this podcast because I was saying how glorious it is for the ball python community to be a good gateway into other species. Well, you know, I don't think that as much anymore because I learned so many bad fucking habits because of ball pythons that I'm now <laughs> serious. Like this whole fucking feeding as much as I should be. I applied that to the other shit that I have. And that's not, I'm feeding way too much. I'm feeding way too much. And it's just like now. I don't know. I mean, I, I think I learned a lot breeding ball pythons. I think because if well, I look yeah. at the history of the pythons that I've bred, they're probably at least 40 to 50% of the overall clutches I've had. That's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of incubation. That's a lot of ovulations. That's a lot of prelay sheds. That's, you see a lot of different scenarios that you can correlate to other species. So I don't, I, you know, it's not all bad. And I mean, I guess I breed my ball pythons like the other things with the food cycling. So I do it basically the same way. Um, I guess if you just come up breeding ball pythons and you, you know, do it one way, then it could have some you know, bad effects on other things, but, you know, people, you should also be able to do different things within your collection. You shouldn't have, there's no one size fits all. You should be able to be like, oh, well, this Savu Python might need a little bit different thing than this ball Python, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've, I've said, I mean, schedules, I think feeding schedules are really, I don't think are very good for snakes. That's what yeah, yeah. But that's it, something like ball pythons taught me to be scheduled like i'm very scheduled when it comes to feeding you know and 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 i've asked patrick many other people like when it comes to other species well shit with emeralds like you know talking to ryan Wilson and and other people they, they don't 
I, I asked him how frequent would you feed like your adult fe females? And he goes, I don't know. Like I, I feed as I, I feed as I see. <laughs> like I, he's like, I, I, I can't tell you a certain time when I feed because I don't have one. Like I feed as I see when I need to feed. And I looked at him like, what the fuck's that supposed to mean? Like, I don't well, thanks for the information. You know what I mean? But it totally makes sense now what he says, you know. And well, the snakes will tell you, like, you know, you can like a chondro and an emerald, they're very good at begging for food just by your presence in the room. I mean, yeah. if you've got a chondro and it's very habituated to you, when you come in the room, it's going to stick its tail out, stick its head out. It's going to wiggle, 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 like, come on, feed me, feed me. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's hungry. No. That, 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 that damn snake's trying to train you. It's yeah. not. <laughs> a truly hungry chondro is an active snake. It'll crawl all over that cage all night long looking to try to go to the next spot to find food. And people, you know, chondros are lazy in captivity because of what we do to them. They're not lazy yeah. snakes. They're no, lazy because we all. don't give them a reason They to can move. afford to be lazy in captivity. The food yeah. just shows up. I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that, Patrick, you probably, you just know when it's time to feed something by looking at it as you're going through your snakes. It's like, you just know, oh, you need to eat. You can just intuit looking at this individual animal. You know every one of them. And you just know what to feed them and when to feed them. It's not a schedule. It's oh, it's Tuesday. Everybody eats today. It's it's like you need to yeah. eat. Yeah, but, but, yeah there's, there's a Patrick babies. You are scheduled. Like it's different. I'm scheduled. I'm scheduled on babies ish. So I, I I so I the only thing that I keep feeding records on are baby chondros. Um, and part of that is because if I have a whole bunch of them. I will need to keep track of what's actually eaten and what hasn't. I don't want to accidentally feed something that I fed the day before. I have so many fucking snakes that I'm, it's always feeding day. Every day that I'm home, I'm, I'm feeding something. And, um, and so I have to keep track with the baby chondros to make sure that they're getting enough. And, uh, and you know, I, I make little notes on my cards about what time they ate and, and whatnot. And just, it helps me keep all that in line. Um, but I'm feeding in this room two or three days out of the week in the juvenile room with my adults. The only time they're scheduling is I like to offer frequent, uh, very small meals to female chondros and, and um, uh, emeralds and sometimes my Amazons too, while they are, um, while they're breeding, uh, I'll separate and, and offer small meals a lot more frequently because I think that abundant signal kind of gets them going, but also um, their feeding response gives me a, a, a lot of good insight into what they are um, into where they're at in their cycle. So I can kind of tell, you know, female chondro will start hesitating. Uh, you know, she'll be, she'll be hesitant to accept and then I'll know and next meal or the one after that, she's going to refuse. And then I know she's going to ovulate three or four weeks after that. So I, I kind of use the feeding um on somewhat of a schedule uh in that instance but as far as just general maintenance on adults i might some of my adult chondros i might feed them uh the females and then feed them again two weeks later i might go five weeks without feeding them it depends on what the like nick said what she looks like where they're at in the reproductive cycle the males i pay no attention to whatsoever i'm like yeah, i'm bored i think i'll feed some male chondros tonight while i'm feeding other stuff i just kind of feed them whenever um, but, um, I, I wanted to say, um, that, uh, believe it or not, the, the subject we're on a minute ago about variability and how we keep stuff. I completely agree a hundred percent with everything both of you guys said, I know it's miraculous. Um, but I, I think, I think a zero pushback on that. I think there are a lot of right ways to do a lot of these things and there's lots of obvious wrong ways so no you don't want to do the wrong thing until it's right you want to do something that's somewhere inside of the parameters of shit that has worked for other people in the past and do it consistently and you will get some type of results and if your con consistency is the only way you can tweak things you can't fucking change things every single time and learn anything at all then yeah. you're just you're just fucking with everything and it doesn't jive with the animals and you get nothing out of that I have to explain that to people when they have a, a bad, this, this happens in, with chondros all the time. I literally every day of my life spend time helping somebody with chondro reproduction every single day. And a lot of times it's a, somebody's their first time breeding. And th the 
they have a bad result and they're like, Oh, I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I got to change this. I'm like, hold up, man. Like maybe sometimes there's one obvious thing where you fucked up. Sometimes that happens, but if everything kind of seemed like it was in the right general range of what was supposed to happen, it probably wasn't on you. It was some other thing. And you just, you can't keep changing shit up. Yeah, the, um, on this, on the subject of keeping different species it, in the same space and, 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 and on that same subject, uh, everything, this is my baby room. I have babies outside of this room that uh, as well, but this is my baby room. Everything in here is in a, in a six or 15 quart tub. And they're all at, you know, 80, 84 ish degrees at the back of the rack. And the front of the tub is variable depending on the ambient room temperature. The ambient room temperature fluctuates anywhere from, sometimes as high as the low eighties during the day in the summer, sometimes as low as the low seventies at night. But you can, if you have a species that has a cooler preference, I can put it lower in the rack. This rack right here has one 24 inch wide strip of heat tape all the way up. It's hotter up top than it is down at the bottom. Everything I keep is okay anywhere in this range. But if I want like my, uh, two stripe forest palm vipers, Oh, there goes they Patrick. Are a cooler, oh. cooler species. You there, buddy? And uh, yeah, got me. Yeah, you're good. Okay, and uh, and it's like that throughout. I have a bunch of snake rooms. All the rest of them are on ambient, but there's if you run around with a temp gun, um, you'll find different places in the room where there's different temperature ranges, and you can just move animals to different spots. That's that's how I have all my stuff arranged, and uh, and uh, there. You just, you don't have to be super specific with it and you don't have to like, it's amazing how dogmatic people are about what, like about just all kinds of shit with reptile husbandry and, and saying that they're, you know, the shit that I see in the groups, man, it just blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, when people contact that. me to talk chondros, I usually ask them, who have you talked to? And if they, <laughs> and if they, and if they tell me, if they tell me a bunch of people, I'm like, look, you don't want to talk to me because yeah. I'm going to tell you completely different shit, and then you're going to be, and then you're going to tell me I'm an idiot. I get yeah. that all the time. Oh, you're well, this guy said this, so you must be a retard. And it's like, well, yeah. no, oh. it's because all of these things work. They just, you know, some things work better for different people, and nobody. This is the thing that that really gets me. If you if you get a person asking a question in a group and you read the answers, I am generally, not always, but generally the only person that if I comment, my comment is half a dozen questions yeah. before I will answer their question. Because you have to figure out the context and, and uh, of what's going on. You get somebody that asks something about their, their animal and you get all these people that just throw individual like single temperature numbers and single parameters and they like I, I saw a post the other day look i really like the guy that made this comment he's an awesome dude but it was a super not helpful at all fucking comment the person was saying that they were having an issue uh with with this snake it's an adult male chondro and it hasn't eaten in a couple months and the animal had a really good body weight like more than sufficient body weight so the first go-to obviously is it's a fucking male and it's december and this it's not eating like that's that's just the thing it took a while of comments before even anybody even brought that up but one person got on and said she said i have she said the hot spot is 85 and his his humidity is about 50 percent and I have a mister on the cage. And the comment from one person was 85 is too hot. <laughs> Dit 50 percent is too low. Ditch the mister. Those were his exact words in the comment. So you said her humidity is too low, but and told but you told her to get rid of the thing that's raising humidity without offering uh, an alternative way to raise the humidity, which you said was too low. And you said 85 is too hot without asking how big the cage is, what the ambient room temperature is, what the cool side of the cage is. Marshall Mendez was on your show on Tuesday saying he's got 92 degree basking spots or whatever on his chondros. And you got to tell me Marshall doesn't know what he's doing. There's a huge range of variability. 
there's a huge range of variables that you have to look at to figure out where you're going to set things and cage size and ambient humid uh, ambient temperature in the room are extremely important so you can't just jump on and say random shit like that and then not offer any type of alternatives or ask any questions to figure it out and that's mostly what we see when people come to help in groups and it's super not fucking helpful well, well i think part of that's the social media age you know right. like back in the forum days man we could write you know practically write half of right half of right groups because yeah. your, answer, your answer stood the test of time and you could go back and look at it other people could go back and refer to it but social yeah. media is just so like quick you know and it, it's gone and it's just down the page and nobody really i don't mean who many, are people really even reading much of that yeah, I mean, so, everyone's an expert on Facebook, so it's like, you know, yeah. it, and people are dying for the answer. And, and the thing is, without even kind of like simmering or like marinating what the answer was, like Patrick was saying, they'll just read it and be like, well, that's what I got to do. Better fucking do that right now. And then they'll, they'll go ahead and make that adjustment without even kind of really thinking what it is that, you know, they're trying to accomplish. But I yeah. mean, fuck, dude, it, like, like, like Ryan says, this is a day and age of social media, man. Like, you know, most of these people aren't even capable of keeping the species just because they don't want to learn how to fucking keep it. You know, they're too quick. One thing I people are terrible at reading their animals too. Yeah. I mean, some people aren't even capable of reading their fucking animals. Like, like legit don't have the eye. And, and, and what's crazy is like, that's why it's like, fuck the whole scheduling thing. Just kind of go off what you see. That's kind of what we need to do, you know, versus off like, you know, because one of these things, Nick, that I, I went apeshit over is I visited someone's, someone I looked up to. I still look up to him, you know, uh, but I went to somebody's collection and realized uh, uh, every drawer that every tub that he was opening had like really dirty water. And then, and like my OCD was like, just throw it out and change it since we're looking at it. And I asked him finally, why aren't you changing the water? And, and he told me, well, it's because it's not Wednesday yet. And it was like a Sunday. And I'm like, well, fuck, like, you're going to wait three more days before you can fucking change it? Because like schedule wise, that's the way you do things. And and, you know, mind you, it was water, but even with feeding, like, I don't think everything needs to be on a fucking, like, here we go, you know, like, let's do it, you know? I mean, if you're going through, if, if you change water every Wednesday, I guess that's fine. But if you're in there on Sunday and you see that it's stanky and you're looking right at it, I mean, no. maybe you did, and you just happened to notice it. Why wouldn't you fix that at that point? You know, it's like, I'm, I clean, I'm. I'm actually, I have to, after this podcast is over, I have to finish cleaning one of my baby rooms and uh, for the 2023, the current year's babies, and I'm about halfway through it. But if I'm in, my computer's in that room. If I'm in there and I see somebody's shit on the paper in the front of the, t I'll clean it midweek. I'm not going to wait until, if I see something's nasty, I'm not going to ignore it. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I may not be doing a detail, go through every single tub, but if you see a problem, yeah get on it one thing to jump back a little bit I, i'd like to point out because if we're in it we do these podcasts and i think the goal for everybody is probably to try to disseminate good information for hobbyists so they can maybe learn something right and patrick hit on a massively important husbandry tip that might fly under the radar for some people everybody talks about temperature and what does temperature mean and it turns out that's a hugely very there's a lot of variables going to temperature but something patrick hit on was the the, re so, the relative size of the basking spot to the size of the enclosure is absolutely massively important. If you have a 95 degree basking spot in a 12 inch cube, yeah, you're probably gonna cook that chondro. If you have a one cubic yard cage that's like a cubic meter and you've got it in the corner, it's small and isolated, not a problem at all. Hmm. That matters, but having a, if your room, if people don't have a, if you need to create a baseline ambient air temperature in a cage because you don't have a, a that isn't created by the room the animal's in, that's mm -hmm. one thing. If you have a warm reptile room, then your basking spots can be warm, but they just need to be isolated and not overheat the rest of the enclosure. Yeah. But that that is a concept yeah. that people, and you know better than me, I mean, being a condor guy, you and Ryan, you, how many times have you seen people that got some little ass cage with a huge radiant heat paddle in it? It's like just just absolutely frying these things it's like you should have a little yeah. tiny little thing over in the corner they're just like they want the heat they go over to the corner and get it and the rest of the cage is not overheated yeah you're so, wondering why you're wondering you're wondering why your snake keeps puking <laughs> oh my god it's overheated it doesn't shed right because it's constantly just desiccated because it's the whole thing well, is overheating the rest of the cage you're putting yeah. a lot of faith in that thermostat too 
<laughs> if oh, that thermostat yeah. screws up, kiss that oh. rest of that kiss that snake. Yeah, that, that single thing. I mean, even if you're keeping snakes in a rack system, like the relatives, how much of the floor space is taken up by heat tape? If you've got a a CB70 with some 11 inch heat tape at the back of it, that's a whole lot different than a three inch pass of heat tape, isn't it? I mean, that these things matter. It's not as simple as you know, this, this number, but how much of the cage is that number and how much is, you know, and it's spin off effects and the rest of it. Yeah. I just want to yeah, call no, attention to that. Like, that's something people need to really be cognizant of. It's like if, you know, the size of your cage relative to the size of your basking spot. Um, yeah. yeah. When I went from having a basement snake room to having a freestanding building and it gets so hot in there, I was freaking out for the first couple of years. I was like, Oh my God, these ambient temperatures are, insanely high i thought all my snakes were gonna die and they're like mm -hmm. no they're fine cool off at night again they don't care what, what would you yeah that's like? oh good that's the the thing that um i think is really important is about um about temperatures that you just said is the the um the ability to get away from it not just inside of the cage but if it's at night it's okay too um you know Terry Phillip used to go on these rants about the 80 degrees thing and things. You just keep everything at 80 all the time and whatever. And um, I could push back on that a whole lot, but I like to use 80. This is for my tropical stuff. I have American stuff and, and some uh, Montane stuff that I do a little bit differently, but for my, most of my snakes, I use 80 as the baseline. And when they're not, when I'm not doing any cycling, I like the um, daytime high to be the same distance from 80 as the nighttime low is. So 84 during the day, 76 at night, for example. That's how I keep most of my stuff. And then all for adult rooms drop a little cooler than that. So they get a little bit further of a night drop for about half of the year. That's actually how I cycle almost, almost all my tropical stuff. It's just cooler at night for part of the year. And that's the only... That's the only difference, but I like 80 as that kind of baseline, but it's, uh, um, it, it, oh, and it, this is, I guess it's not really off subject. What you just said about it getting really hot in there. I meant to say this quite a while ago when you, um, I just want to throw this in there. When you mentioned temp gunning, that animal is like 20 degrees above the ambient temperature. Um, just an interesting, uh, note. Brian Hummel, I know you guys know Brian Hummel. Um, <laughs> Brian. Uh, and well, you know, the first time I met you, Nick, was actually maybe the only time was that, you know, at that table with Blake Bauer and Sean Christian and Brian Hummel at NARBC. Okay. And, uh, um, and, and shout out to Brian. He's probably not listening to this, but I, I love Brian Hummel. He one time, we, we were having a heat wave in Texas and he got into his room and, you know, he did maternal on anything that would wrap eggs. If they wrap the eggs up, he let him let him rock. He walked into his room and had female pythons uh, carpets incubating, and it was ninety three degrees in the um, in his snake room. And he went and temp gunned a female carpet that was maternally incubating, got her to move her head a little bit, and temp gunned the egg mass. And the egg mass was still eighty seven degrees, eighty eight degrees, wow. with it with it ninety three in the room. So I just thought that was cool that they can also maintain the temperature that's lower than what the ambient is and, and higher. It, it takes time for them to rise. Eventually, the snake will be the room temperature, but it it's not instantaneous. Oh, eventually. Eventually, it, it, yeah. It probably never achieve that because by the time the snake gets close to that, the room is already cooling off and it's going to start Exactly. So, exactly, which goes right back around to what Ryan was saying. is like as long as they cool off at night, they're okay. I'll never yeah, well, forget that. that, that the thermal mass of the snake, too. And Hummel wore that like or that bright ass orange pineapple shirt. The, the Hawaii, the Hawaiian shirt with the yeah. big pineapple on it. Yeah, yeah, he, he always wore that. He always wore that. I, I sent I sent a picture of this um, to Nick the other day, but I, I my one of my cousins brought me some old belongings of mine that she found in her in her garage or something, and um, I found a uh, a fortune cookie, like the piece of paper out of a fortune cookie, and on the back of it. It said striped brettles and had a phone number and said inland reptile uh, on, on the back of it. And that was from when I when I met Nick at NARBC in like 2009 or something like that. Long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Patrick, I have a wrap-up topic. If you want to get one ready to go after mine, that'd be great. Okay. 
Okay. Um, now, <laughs> Ryan, Ryan is a part of a, a group chat that we have going on Instagram with some other fellows of ours, good friends of ours. And uh, Ryan, I, I can't. I laughed hysterically because I know it was a serious question, but you, when you asked about ID and hey, does anybody ID in here? Um, as far as like you know documentation and keeping notes of your productions, and I thought like I, if you would ask me, does Ryan Young keep track of all this shit? Without even asking, I would could have sworn he would. You know what I mean? But you're not much of a no documentation keeper, are you, Ryan? Like you don't really do a lot. No, of that. no. I meant, does anybody still use the the initials? Like, I guess when I label my baby, I was we were talking about Condros, and I was like, you know, back in the day, everybody put their initials in their ID number for their baby Condros, and I was like, man, I don't do that anymore. Wow. And I was just, I was just asking, like, am I the only one who stopped doing that, or do you know, do the other guys? Because my, you know, I, and I gave you an example of one of my serial numbers, and it doesn't have my initials. Um, it has, like, if if I got a snake from Patrick, it would have his initials, you know. So I would, there's an interchangeable area in my ID numbers, and I was just, you know, based on your conversation with Bruce, I was sitting there wondering, do the Condro guys still? put their initials in their I do. ID yeah. numbers. And that's all I was asking because I'm actually, I'm a relatively, for reproductive data, I'm relatively meticulous. But um, Well, I was going to ask you guys, like for any new keeper out there who's wondering like what piece of information is important to keep while you're raising a snake, getting it to breeding size, and then they even breed. Like what would your advice be for anyone who's wondering like how do I, like what what documentation do I need to keep? Depends what your goal is, I guess. If uh, reading chondros, how about that? <laughs> um, well, uh, other than like Patrick said, when they're little, I think it's a good idea to keep track of uh, your feeding more closely when they're big. My attitude is if you can remember the last time you fed it, you fed it too soon. So it's okay. uh, I don't document any of that stuff, I only pay attention to reproductive times. I write down ovulations, pre lay sheds, lay dates, hatch dates, weighing adults during reproductive cycles but i don't i basically keep track of nothing else after that what about you that's Nick? something that is pretty useful is the timing of reproductive events mm -hmm. on an individual animal basis yes. and since they get into an annual sort of seasonal rhythm you will have this you'll have some females that you know that you breed regularly like they just always go at the beginning of the season some that always go late and some that always go in the middle that's just where they are i i learned this lesson when i i built my snake building in uh, 2008 or whatever. Uh, and it was like every contractor story. You pay the contractor and you give them half the money for the construction project. And then they fucking disappear for six months. And then they show up at the last possible second. So basically my <laughs> snake building was finished four months late. Like it didn't get finished until a month after I started cycling, was supposed to have already started cycling. Mm. So I was a couple months behind. Uh, and I only have a few large egg boxes for big clutches, like olive python clutches. And uh, a female olive python, she laid two years in a row. She laid, it was one of the only clutches I got that year, the building, because everything was shifted so late. Uh, but she lay, I grabbed the piece of glass to put on the egg box, and it just happened to be the same piece of glass from the year before. Damn female laid on the same exact day, 365 to the day, the next year, even though I started cycling like two and a half months later. Wow. Like she went on the same day because that rhythm gets established and that train left the station, whether my building was done or not. Right. And so knowing when a female went last, they tend to go around that. You don't see something goes like in October one year and then June the next year. Usually they'll Correct. tend to go on a, a pretty annual basis. So that knowing when you can expect things is pretty useful. Yeah. I take copious notes around reproductive events, but right. that's mainly in lieu of, potential future writing projects where that information will be pertinent. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, I'm weighing a bunch of snakes now. <laughs> like, All right, Pat, Patrick, what do you got for him, bro? Um, I, I just want to say that if, if I, if I need to check my notes on reproductive, uh, uh, you know, activities, I just do a, a, a search in, in my conversations with Brian Fisher and it'll pop up cause I send him everything that obviates, <laughs> but, uh, that's a joke. I try to keep track of that stuff. Um, so 
I, I honestly think you may have asked Ryan this question, but I'm going to ask both of them the same question. And maybe it's an easy one, but it's something that, that interests me um, a lot. Um, both of you guys, you said, Nick, you said you bred um, uh, 15 species of pythons. Um, this year? Yeah, 2023. Yeah. I think it's yeah. 15. And then, and then Ryan, uh, what's your total number of python species that you've bred at this point? 35 35 okay so um i'll i'll ask you first but i'm asking all the same question um what species do you look forward to reproducing in the future the most that you have not yet bred and it doesn't have to be a python well for me it would be a python i mean there's okay. turtle stuff i'd like to breed but um yeah I my I really want to get uh, popwin pythons is probably that's that's one of my Everest species I guess or not Everest but uh, Rushmore species. So. Yeah, do you have them now? Yeah. Okay, so it's something you're currently working on. Awesome, awesome. And what about you, Nick? Uh, I want Ryan to breed the popwin pythons. There's <laughs> 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 two of the. Because a pair of the ones he's got are mine. I sent them over to him. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm, I'm rooting for him. <laughs> That'd be sick. Yeah. That's, uh, a, that's, a, that's a good answer, actually. Right? They've really, been, they've uh, been, uh, they breed a lot, but so far I've, I've had... I happened, I've had into, I happened into some, but I didn't have anywhere to put some big-ass, nasty popwin pythons. And Ryan okay. did. So okay, well, okay. What about that species? Literally bypassed me and went right to Ryan. Every, okay, what, what, what about that species being like a real fucking difficult species to get down to breeding? What's up with like the, the female always eating the male from what I've heard? What do you guys know about that? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how much I'm believing that anymore. Um, I've got, I think. I think one of the things, the snakes I thought was a girl is actually a boy. The two that I tried to pair last year and the, uh, the one they were trying to kill each other. Oh boy. And when you put them and I, so this year I was like, man, I don't know. And I've probed it and it doesn't really probe like you would think it would for a boy, but it probes a little more than you would think a girl does. And so I'm like, man, I don't know. I really got, I'm really second guessing it. So I put the male in there again. And I actually, I put a different male because I'm like, well, it clearly didn't like that other boy. Yeah. So I put another known male in with it. And it was like, they instantly were like fighting like carpet pythons. And I'm like, dude, this thing's got to be a freaking male. And so I, I put it, I've currently got two females and what I think is four males. And I'm breeding two of the males to one of the females and two of the males to the other female. And the one that I thought was a female I put with a female and they totally, I've never seen them lock, but they cuddle and they hide in the hide box together. I've, it's the only one. It's the only snake I haven't seen actually breed. The other three males I've seen lock. This one I haven't seen lock, but they, the girls so far have shown no interest in eating the boys when they're known boys. <laughs> and I, don't know, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if they, if people are trying to pair them when they're not reproductively ready and that's why they're eating each other, or if it's strictly pop wins when they want to have a real food response. And so if you're messing around in your snake room and you got a pop win pair together, you know, your female might just grab the boy out of like, Oh shit, something's moving. You better try to kill it. So I don't know. I'm, I'm really kind of second guessing. I haven't had one try to eat one. Um, the females will bite the males sometimes when you go to put them in there, just but they they don't when they do it, they're like instantly like regret it. They're like, Oh shit, this isn't a mouse or a rat, and they let go. So, my experience thus far now, I have not bred them, so this is all anecdotal. But so far, when I've put none of the females have shown any interest or they'll breed with any of the males so far. They don't seem to be too concerned with that, like all the information I'd had in the past told to me. So I don't know. I can only go on that. The, they've both seemed receptive to the two males. I haven't tried all four males with all two girls because I, I would actually knock on wood if I was successful. I would like to have unrelated babies, but. They you, know, so we, you, know, you know, we were holding other snakes like, you know, we we're saying like Bullens is kind of ranked pretty high over whatever reason. 
I definitely feel like pop one olives are on same level, if not cooler than a Bullens. I think personally, I pop ones are. It's it, fucking they're, just, they're, whole, they're, it's they're, whole pressure, really, bro. they're real cool snakes. They're very prehistoric. Yeah, very yeah. interesting snakes. Fucking badass. This episode be, be that would be if I could if I if you I'd give up everything to breed those this year. And get has has Sonia has Sonia bred hers? I have I don't no. I think, don't think so. I know y'all. Sonia Kumo. Y'all. I thought one of you, you guys I don't was, know Sonia. No, know. we know her. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if she has her. I, I haven't. Think, I haven't seen her. Personally. Yeah, I know she's kept them for a long time, and she's uh um nobody really knows who she is but she's she's bred quite a few things yeah um, yeah never heard of her there was right, a canadian, Nikki, i think there was an american and a canadian that bred them last year yeah yeah i've heard of one person uh, I think josh is it, I, I, I had one guy reach out to me tell me he had success um i can't remember if he's in canada or this or here in the states but it's been a couple people. I think sure. it's like everything. I mean, if it works, then it's like, oh, that was easy. And if it doesn't, it's like, <laughs> oh, that was hard. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I've tried, I've tried what this would be the third year I've tried with one of the females. So to, in my mind, it's like, oh, they're a little more difficult, but it'll, we'll see. If it takes a few more years, then I guess I'll think they're a real pain in the ass. But I guarantee you get this shit down eventually, bro. I mean, you're, you're on fire. Well, I'll stick it out till it goes, but. Yeah. So uh, I'd rather they just get it over with and I can breathe a sigh of relief. What I don't know if I'm going to be relieved or happy. <laughs> what, Sometimes what, when I've read stuff, I felt more relief than uh, actual joy. So, what year do you think it's going to be, Ryan, when you hit 50 species under under your belt? As far as uh, uh, I don't know, that's that's <laughs> 50 is a big. That's a long. That would be practically everything you could get minus one thing. I think so. Jesus. That would be that would be that's probably an unattainable goal, but I thought passing VPI was going to be unattainable too. So who knows? Damn yeah, man. Well, guys, two hours went by very very quickly. Uh, we had over a hundred people tapped in at one point. So we'll start with you, Ryan. What do you have to say to all the love and support that we had on tonight's show? I appreciate it. It's all because of you, brother. Oh no, man. It's all because of you, man. <laughs> You're no, the personality. Not. I'm not I got much personality. <laughs> You're the one doing this thing every three times a week or whatever the hell you do it. I don't well, know I will say do it. episodes like this make my job very easy. I mean, especially fucking, you know, having Nick on is and Patrick. I mean, they do. They just go. You, you hit play and it just, it just goes. It just goes, you know, and and uh, but Nick, what do you have to say? We had over 100 people tapped in uh, tonight's show. What do you have to say to all the love and support the people you've mentored, people who are excited to see you tonight? Um, it's, I mean, it makes you feel like uh, maybe what you did mattered in the long run. It's like that people want to tune in and listen to you. It's like, so it's kind of like I don't know, a little flattering, really. It's, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad to, I don't know, get have an opportunity to really give people good information. There's so much negativity in our hobby and social media, and so much is polit politics and bullshit in the hobby. And it's nice to be able to just like, you know, I don't know, get around with like-minded individuals. And talk about things you're passionate about and maybe share a little bit of legit information with people. Yeah. And so it's a good opportunity to do that. I, I don't well, know. I think man. this is the first podcast I've done where I actually know I've met all of you <laughs> <laughs> in the flesh. <laughs> yeah. Epic. Uh we, we can't I can't wait to hang out again though, man. Seriously. And uh Nick, looking forward to meeting you someday. Uh, but do me a favor, guys, please go give Ryan. Uh, follow on Instagram, Molecure Reptiles. Is that that's your IG, right? Um, yeah, Ryan. Molecular and then, Reptile. And Nick, are you are you? What's up with Instagram? You don't really care much, or what, what's what are you doing as far uh, as Instagram goes? I forget that Instagram exists. <laughs> I uh, I have an Instagram page because years ago when Facebook bought Instagram and I had a little bit of insomnia, I was up at like three in the morning on my phone because I couldn't sleep, and <laughs> Facebook just kept popping up. Do you want to set up an Instagram page? Do you want to set up an Instagram page? I'm like, okay. Cause I couldn't sleep. And then I forgot about it for like four years. And then I log in once in a while and I see like, there's just piles of messages and everybody thinks I'm an asshole cause they never responded, but it really, I just don't ever open Instagram. So. So Facebook would be best to follow. Like whoever wants to just kind of see your work. Facebook is definitely easier. I'm trying to get a bit better about Instagram. Okay. But 
Well, well MJ, I so. give you all the credit. I never did anything on Instagram till you were busting my balls. Dude, uh, because I mean, god damn it. Even Patrick was like very not Instagram for a while. And like we're he forum did, guys, all right. See, this did, shit's all wrong. We're forum Patrick guys. Had, Patrick had more yoga poses on his fucking account than snakes at one point, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what Insta's for though? Like oh, okay. Yes. It's not, yes. It's not for okay. fatty. Let me tell you a story real quick how me and Patrick met and why I didn't like Patrick at first. Because, Pat, <laughs> and, and you know, obviously he was right, but I was a noob and I didn't want to listen. And I posted a picture that the importer sent me and I bought the snake, but I posted the picture that the importer sent me. And Patrick just commented saying, hey, man, I, I, I just, from, based off that look of that snake, it looks very dehydrated. And I was like, fuck, how do you, how can you fucking even tell? And now I could tell what he means, right? But either way, I, what do I do? I click on his name. I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? I don't see any snakes, bro. All I see is fucking yoga poses. And I'm like, and I'm like, you think I was like, you think I'm gonna listen to you? Like, who the fuck are you? And then of course, <laughs> and then and then of course I become friends with Forrest and then other people, and then they're like, tell me Patrick Holmes, Patrick Holmes. And then I see you on Facebook, and then I'm like, I see this whole other pers persona on Facebook, and everyone's like Patrick Holmes, and then I'm like, what the fuck? Do you not care about Instagram? But long story short, <laughs> the yoga threw me off at the beginning with Patrick. Um, but now we're really good friends, and I go to him for all my advice now. So, <laughs> so Hey, guys, seriously, have a good night. I appreciate you being a part of this, Ryan, Nick. Uh, but, guys, give it up for my two homies, Nick Mutton and Ryan Young, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right, man. Hey, have a good night, guys. I appreciate you. Take care, man. All right, peace. Take care. Whew, what an episode, man. Um, dude, you got you got to eat dinner and you got to feed Condros, like and it and it was almost like you weren't even doing it. I I fed Condros, Waggler's Vipers, Bush Vipers, Basins, Scrub Pythons. Uh wow. I think that I think that's it. I think that's you all fed, I fed. You fed Venomous during this episode? Yeah. Yeah. Man. You're wild. I was, tease feed, I, I was tease feeding baby Waggler's vipers right here. Yeah, look. Uh, I saw that. And I was like, is that a venomous snake? And sure enough, I yeah. mean, is that really biosecurity what you're doing right there? It's like, I feel like you're just um, being very like, who gives a shit? No, I'm not at all. That's why I just got out the tool. Like, what to if get it, this out? Dude, you're, oh, my heart's racing right now. This is crazy. Well, I'm nowhere near this animal. It's forced you, perspective. I know. It's just I just you know I've been injured a lot. Um, but I gotta tell you, <laughs> I, I gotta tell you though, you produce those right, Patrick, or no? Uh, no, no, I didn't produce them. They they were born in my care, but they were born to um, import females that were imported gravid. We we brought in three gravid uh, females this year because we wanted to have some captive born and raised stock to work with, and I just kind of assumed that the I'd be lucky if one of them dropped and any of them survived. All three of those female Wagler's Vipers are still alive and doing great. And, uh, and I sold some of the babies and I, I, I kept a few for myself and, um, and they're doing awesome. They're kicking ass. Let me ask you, before I let you go tonight, what's your overall goal with Venomous, Patrick? Like, do you ever feel like you're going to get to the point where you're more open about the Venomous work you do, like your Condros, or are you always just going to keep that a, like a low key thing? The, the reason that, um, I, that's that's not a conscious choice that I make. It's it's about it's about the amount of time that I have. Mm -hmm. I'm insanely busy. I do a, way too much stuff. I'm I have a lot of room for improvement with my time management and organizational skills. Um, as a, a lot of anybody who knows me really well knows, I just started adulting like a few years ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you know paying taxes and all that stuff. And um, the chondros are what. I know the the most and I know how to help the most mm -hmm. and they're my favorite snakes. And that's what I have them. I have way more of those than any other one species. And so that's why that's what you see them the most of um, in, you know, the, because I just have to choose what I spend time on as far as talking about and helping people and whatnot. I also with the venomous snakes, um, I keep a lot of different species. I have a whole bunch of venomous snakes. I just, um, it's less important for me to have as much of an online presence with that because I don't really like selling venomous snakes. Um, 
a, a lot of the stuff I'm just kind of keeping for fun. I do have plans to breed all or almost all the species that I keep, but I don't have any desire to like post them for sale or anything. Everything that I keep is stuff that like is rare enough that the homies will want it and I won't ever have to post it or it's stuff that's common enough that I can just dump it on one of my friends. I have lots of friends who sell venomous snakes and I can let them, uh, you know, take them and do that, do that for me. So yeah. I did that last week. I dumped a bunch of stuff on a, on a friend. They were all amazing animals. Um, and it was just like, here, take these and he's selling them and we're making money. I, I just don't have time to mess with it. Um, I, I barely have time to, um, well, like I told you earlier, I got called into work today, threw my whole schedule off. Now I have a bunch of extra dirty cages that I didn't get to, you know? Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate you pulling through and being here because you definitely made this episode as special as it was. It's because I know, Thank like, you. you know, it's as much as I, um, as much as I'm passionate and fired up to have guests on, like, sometimes you just need somebody with more experience to kind of relate to certain topics and also, yeah. like, different opinions. And you know, I love, I do one thing I love about you, Patrick, you don't give a fuck who it is that you're talking to, yeah. if, if you have to kind of stand on what you believe in, you, you're not afraid to say it, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and I feel like that's what the world needs. Like we need more like, you know, cause it's not all about like, well, let me just not say anything. No, hell no. Like we kind of need opinions on what their experience, what your experience is versus others. And, and I felt like a lot of that went down tonight. So. Yeah. Well, that's why I was excited about this show. I know we, we talked about that earlier. Um, and you've obviously you asked me at the beginning of the show, but, um, Ryan and Nick both have insane amounts of experience and specifically with pythons, which is obviously kind of my thing. And they, but they're both uh, very opinionated guys and they, um, you know, they have a, a certain type of, um, well, you see the, the rants that Nick goes on and, and Ryan can just be kind of a smart ass about stuff. And that's one of the things that's awesome about those guys, but also I knew what rants they would go on and what they would say. And so I, I specifically had some of that stuff uh, locked and loaded to push back on, on some of those things. But it's it, the whole point is being able to have open discussion about this stuff. Um, it's not about saying who's right or who's wrong. There's a million different ways to do it. And so we just all share that and we, you know, we talk some shit and, and, uh, and hopefully people have fun and get some good information out of it. Right. Yeah, I mean, we literally have two people who are very good at what they do, and their scheduling on how they do it is complete opposite. So yeah. that tell I mean, what else is there to explain after that? Like, holy shit. Uh, yeah. but listen, enjoy your night, Patrick. I know you're like I said, you. You, I appreciate you, you being well. here. It always means a lot when you come through, and I know a lot of people value your time as I do. But uh, what do you have to say to the hundred plus people we had tapped in tonight? Well, the first thing I have to say is to you, I want to thank you for bringing me on again, because this time and the last time you had me on the other day with the Condro kind of round table thing we did with Pedro, I kind of feel like um, there's a part of me that's still kind of a fangirl over it. And I feel like we're backstage hanging out with rock stars. And, uh, and then, and then the, uh, there's another part of me that is deeply grateful to just be included with these guys that, that I admire and guys that are so successful. So I, I, I want to thank you for bringing me on with those people. I really appreciate it. Um, and to all the people who, for some reason, like listening to me talk about snakes, um, I, I love you all and I appreciate you as well. And uh, keep talking to me. I'll talk back. And IG, uh, as far as what to follow with your work, it was Ar Arboreal Obsession, correct? That's the... Uh... Yes. Yeah, I have a Arboreal Obsession is my um, Instagram and my Facebook. It's Arboreal underscore Obsession on Facebook and Instagram. And then obviously personal Facebook page and my personal Instagram. Uh, it, it's these days probably more snakes and, and, and less yoga. I still do the yoga. I just don't take as many pictures of it. But you know, like for instance, you said you have you have a bee act that's still available. Where do you put? Where do you post your animals for sale at? Like, where can people? I, I, man, I I should post more, and honestly, I should post stuff on my Facebook page. I I rarely have to post anything for sale, um, but I I usually post stuff in my Instagram story that needs to go. Right now, I have just a couple of chondros and a few baby Amazon tree boas, and this giant fucking tiger rat snake that somebody please buy from me. 
because I've posted him like three times and I love that snake and he's awesome and he needs a way bigger cage than what I'm giving him. So if anybody needs a big, badass tiger rat snake, hit me up and I will hook you up. Fuck yeah. All right, man. Well, I'll put all your links in the description below. But guys, Thanks, brother. give it up for the man, Patrick Holmes, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. All right, bro. Have a good night, Patrick. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. You too, man. Catch you later, MJ. All right, man. Fuck yeah. Great episode, guys. Definitely uh, one I'm going to re-listen to probably tonight. Learned a lot. Um, but guys, the beauty of everything. Okay, let me slow down. This podcast is all about bringing people who have been doing this for many, many years and just kind of give them, give us your their insight on why they do certain things. Tonight, we had three combined, you would say, experience-wise, damn near 100 years combined experience. All on one show tonight, right? Um, all have different opinions on some so, some matters, but more importantly, just people who stuck it out. Um, if you really love something, you'll stick it out, right? More importantly, don't keep in don't keep any reptile for the money, um, no matter what it is. That's one thing that's kind of just an eye opener for me. And I'm very blessed to have the amount of species that I do work with, even though it's a lot of work and stuff, but man, I'm fired up and that's what keeps me fired up because I have so many things that I'm yet clueless. I feel like compared to ball pythons, man, I'm fucking clueless, but that's my, that's my drive. That's my purpose is becoming a little less clueless. I think even in 10 years, I'll still be clueless. I mean, you have some of the top people in the game who are still figuring shit out. Um, so gotta love it, man. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, please do me a favor. Hit the like button. Let's get the likes up. Likes should get over 100 tonight. I really feel personally the likes should be over 100 on tonight's live because how epic it was. Nick Mutton, Ryan Young, co-host Patrick Holmes, super epic. Hit the subscribe button. I'm just shy of 10,000 subscribers. Help your boy MJ get there. It's one of my goals. So please, if you've been watching my podcast on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and then also hit the notification bell so you're on top of every single podcast i drop here as i told you guys earlier three podcasts as i drop every single week i do not miss hardest working reptile podcast in the game and it's been that way monday tuesday thursdays all right so i'll catch you guys here next time hope you guys have a great week enjoy your weekend and i'm out man thank you so much patrick holmes for coming in the clutch i appreciate that oh by the way if you're looking for exclusive content if you want to become a part of something huge that's growing by the day, go down to the very first link in the description below. Click on it. Join the Trap Talk Patreon family for all exclusive content. You get tapped in with over 185 trappers in the Discord. The IG group chat is cracking. So many connections, so many ways to connect yourself into something so amazing like the reptile world, man. But thank you to all my Patreon members. You guys are my heart. I love you guys. But it's a wrap for episode 425. Have a good night. I'll see you here Monday, and I'm out. Cheers.